A quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have very, two, two very quick announcements tonight. One is uh, just the order of our business. We will start with 16. That's the article we moved out of order last week. When we're done with that, we will go back to where we left off before we did that, Article 4. And we'll go 4 through 12, and then we'll skip up to 17. And then we will complete with instructional motions, which is Article 2. Um, as far as instructional motions go, I mentioned we had two already from last week. We have two more tonight, bringing us to a total of four. So I would like to read those to you right now, although they will not be taken up until the end of the meeting. Uh, number one is use of renewable, en renewable energy. Direct the select board to begin as soon as possible a review of town and school energy use in order to identify opportunities to use renewable energy, including alternative energy vehicles, and to generate renewable energy. And number two, split of the town's discretionary budget between town and the schools. Direct the school board, the school committee, and the finance committee to review the percentage split of the town's discretionary budget between the town and the schools. And after initial individuals, individual reviews of this issue, as a group, the finance, uh, at the finance, excuse me, the financial forum, engage town meeting members and town residents in a discussion of the appropriate split of the town's discretionary budget between the town and the schools. All right, with that, we are now ready to uh, begin Article 16, Mr. Weston. Good evening. Um, so to recap where we left off um, on Thursday night, we approved um, Article 15, which was a um, uh, including a mixed-use uh, uh, development type in the um, in the um, table of uses and all, everything that sort of went along with that. Um, as I, uh, for those that weren't here on Thursday night, um, I did give the presentation on this Article 16. The two are intertwined. Um, Article 15 and 16. Article 15. Um, uh, added a new section into uh, section five of the zoning um, uh, uh, zoning bylaw. This one deals with section six, which includes all the dimensional controls and intensity regulations. So we created two different um, uh, two different warrant articles, uh, but they are both uh, dealing with the same thing. Um, so um, to as I mentioned. Um, this is um, this is dealing with the dimensional parts of adding uh, the mixed-use zoning into the bylaw, um, and um, aligning, making sure that this language matches what was passed um, uh, on Thursday night. And there are two other um, things that we need to we needed to clarify. Um, uh, this is the this is the. Uh, <laughs> The dimensional controls, um, adding uh, uh, the different setbacks, we'll come back to that because we, we discussed that a lot on, um, on Thursday. Uh, this was what was in the, the warrant. Um, defining the gross floor area, uh, uh, specifics on landscaped areas, um, buildings per lot, uh, essentially just <laughs> matching the text that was already approved. Um, footnotes, uh, and these are the two uh, areas that uh, are not necessarily related to the mixed use um, zoning, but changes that need to be done in section six. One is um, uh, the lot shape, uh, defining the lot shape of when there's uh, uh, the, the lots on a cul-de-sac, making sure that we're not um, uh, creating a, some kind of calculation that really can't be done. Um, and then uh, this uh, item on um, uh, intense, titled intensity regulations, but it really has to do with uh, making sure that, or, or declaring specifically that uh, a, a use wouldn't be um, uh, 
the dimensionals um, controls wouldn't cause a, a use to be um, non-conforming. Uh, so that's a presentation, but I do also want to go, Julie, do you have the, um, to some um, recommended changes based on our discussion on Thursday? So procedurally, I'm not sure about how to make these changes. Well, or you, are, these you changes. are actually making the motion now. So whatever, okay. whatever is up there is the motion before us. You don't need to make amendments okay. if, that's okay. the, if, if that's what your plan is. Um, and so what we'd like to do, as uh, opposed to what was in the Warren article, is include um, a five-foot setback um, uh, in the front yard instead of the zero, um, as was discussed on, on Thursday. Um, uh, include that in the text and then also include the um, clause that we had discussed about um, about um, sharing parking and the intent that it wasn't to share parking with a residential unit uh, 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 use but a non-residential um, use um, in the abutting property so those are the three things that we had discussed and we wanted to make sure they carried through to this section as well Are you all set? Yep. We've already had the CPDC report, so we'll now open it to general discussion. Is there a discussion? No, no. Oh, yes, in the back. Hi, it's uh, Bob Coulter, Precinct 6. If you have a five-foot setback for a new industrial or, or commercial development, residential, um, is there any consideration to make that greater? And the only reason for asking is, if you have a pole line in front and you try to build that structure, you won't be able to build it safely with the OSHA requirement rules. So it's just that when, when you're proving that five feet, it might have to be greater. It might have to be 15 or 20 based on the existing pole line. Correct. So, correct. Thank you. So, yeah, so this is what would be allowed in zoning. Uh, we also, right, this goes, the first step in any development approval is to go through a site plan review, and certainly, yeah, one of the first things we look at is um, safety considerations, so sight lines coming out of driveways, pole lines, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Uh, Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, could you bring that up to the five-foot setback that you just referenced, or side lots and so forth? Yeah, right there. Um, just a friendly thought. Could we spell it out the same as we do before, shall be, or 20, and then 20 and f five in parentheses, rather than just, oh, five feet? I think it's... Con it, it's a little bit more consistent with the the rest of the wording. The zero is crossed out, so it's just it's the number. Yeah, if five. you look up above it, John, uh, furniture line shall be 20 feet, something similar to that. In other words, the lot may have five, and then parent and in parentheses the five feet. You see what I'm saying, Julie? Up about the front lot line shall be 20 feet, parentheses 20 feet. Yep. If it, I think the same thing should apply here from, for the sake of consistency. I know government doesn't like consistency, but because that makes things simple. Take out the zero, put just parentheses on the front. The zero fly. is struck. It's just in okay. there because Thank of the, you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it is any other places you have it, but I might want to consider the same thing. Is that okay with the movers? Yes. yes. Is there any objection? No, not up here. Um, yes, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Uh, I apologize. I, I walked in uh, in 
a little after you had started, so I, I may have missed this point. I, I support uh, the substance of, of the article. I just had a question. Um, in the very beginning under 6.0, Uh, yeah, it, right where the cursor is, where you say uh, intensity regulations, um, or has been granted the proper relief. Um, I, I, I found that term a little bit ambiguous. I assume what you mean by that is the relief, set, for example, as we talked about the other night, for a waiver under the bylaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Yes, that's correct. Um, we wanted to clarify that it is possible to establish a certain use building or structure with the proper procedures and town processes and relief, whether it be a waiver, a variance, a special permit, whatever that may be. Okay. Uh, thank you. That being the case, I, I, I'm, I'm not looking to make this more complicated, but I um, found the use of the term proper to be a little bit ambiguous, and I would suggest um, I know Mr. Brown is uncomfortable with inconsistency. I'm a little uncomfortable with ambiguity. Um, could it be uh, as an amendment uh, to change proper um, so that, that that bold portion reads, or has been granted the relief allowable by these bylaws? If that's what you mean, I would propose that. I will defer to town council on this, if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Meares. Well, we're just trying to imagine all the other ways that the relief might come through a special act or through um, uh, through the general laws or whatever. So we're a little uncomfortable with that language, um, but I wonder if you would uh, be satisfied with taking, uh, substituting the word appropriate for proper. I, uh, thank you, I, I, I appreciate that suggestion. I was thinking that it may be by, by law as well, um, and I would assume that in most instances, uh, the by law it would otherwise be exempt from the from the zoning bylaws but uh, and i don't want to make too much of this but would would you all be comfortable if it said or has been granted uh the relief allowable by law yes as long as it's in two words by law yes that's yeah, that, that yeah. <laughs> so, so he didn't like appropriate. No, no. Oh, you know that. Yes. If I may, while you're doing that, um, it also shows up. I don't know, Mr. Moderator, if this would be by two amendments, but it shows up in that sentence. Uh, actually, oh, you got it twice. All right. I'm sorry. I should have paid more attention. Okay. Is, Thank you. Are the movers okay with that as part of your motion? Is there any objection? None appearing. Any other discussion? Are we ready for the vote? Over here. Okay. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Binda. Are we just discussing the amendment? No, we, we've accepted the amendment. I've just asked if, uh, if there was any objection, and there was none. Okay, then may I speak? Do you have a comment? Yes, from Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, that same sentence, no existing lot, building or structure shall, and then the new languages be made non-conforming or become more non-conforming, et cetera. The sentence is actually, the way the bylaw is written, no existing lot, building or structure shall be changed in size or shape so that the height area, yard, or coverage provisions herein prescribed are exceeded. And you don't have that up there and it's not stricken out. But that is the actual text of the bylaw. 
<laughs> Thank you, Ms. Binda, that is correct. Um, so I have a question. So I guess that would, if you want to change it, it needs to be added and stricken. But I'm, I'm wondering why it's being changed. So right now it says no, it says no, no existing lot, building, or structure shall be changed in size or shape so that the height, area, yard, or coverage provisions here and prescribed are exceeded. And I suppose if you wanted to, you could add, unless granted the proper allowable relief allowable by law. But I'm wondering, what's the difference between what exists and what you're changing it to? Mr. Meares. Well, I don't know if this is the only difference, but one difference, the existing language uh, only addresses um, new exceedances. It does not address increases in exceedances. So that's, I think, one of the things that they were attempting to get was to make it non-conforming or more non-conforming. Um. Are you all set? For that section. So, so you're adding the language and then you're going to strike it out? Is that what's. Yeah. yeah. That's, okay. Yeah, that's um, on section 6.2.4, I'm confused by the section that says that is not part of the mixed use project shall not exceed. Does this mean that only 40% I, I, don't, I don't understand the gross floor area of a multi dwelling that is not part of a mixed use project. Okay, so is that so just a traditional multifamily, is that what that means? Okay, and you have to add that in because now you've add. okay, all right, I get that now. So, and that would be the same with 6.2.5 that is not part of a mixed use project. You have to add that in now that you've added, okay. And then um, the, the table, the dimensional tables. So when we were talking about business A district, the required frontage, we were talking about corner lots and lots with shared parking, but this is just frontage. So that's kind of a different thing because there could be lots of lots that don't have the shared parking and also don't have, that aren't corners. So, so it applies to the whole district and not just corner lots, and the zero fee. Okay, so I'm going to throw something out there. I was very happy that um, Ms. O'Neill um, proposed that there be frontage. I wish there had been more. And I think a few other people that I've heard mention wish there could be more, too. Um, is it possible to make an amendment, a proposal to change that to 10 feet? You want to change the 5 feet to 10 feet? Is that correct? I do. I want okay. to change the 5 feet to 10 feet. All I right. think that, you know, I, 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 I was looking at corner lots. I was looking at all of it. I just, I just think that, you know, there's, there's a big difference between a two-story building that is on the street line and what could be a four or five story building on the street line. And I think that, I, I mean, I, I admire the vision that you have for it to become walkable. I don't, I don't know how realistic it is considering it's, it's a state highway, there's no parking on the street, the whole condi the conditions of it. And I just feel that Five feet is just not enough of a setback, especially with the size of the buildings that could go up. I mean, I, I don't want to really 
hinder um, developers, but I, I would like to see it 10 feet. Is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Thank you. Yes. Hi, Heather Klisch, Precinct 7. Um, that proposal, uh, with words taken right out of my mouth, except, and I, I have a question, I was actually going to propose that it be 15, and this gets to my question. I know, I know we just discussed this the other day, but when I look down at all of the other requirements for front yard, the required front, the required setback, the required front yard in Business A District, it ranges from 15 to, for hotels and motels, 50. And so I guess my question is, what was the rationale for having it be so narrow? And my proposal to extend it to 15 has to do with sight lines and thinking that mixed use development down in the Business A District, which is right the South Main Street area, would be terrific. And it would be terrific to encourage more walking, maybe biking, to local services, because more people are living around the businesses and services. Ms. Klisch, I'm, just, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. I just um, conferred with the town council. Okay. Changing this, anything from five, even, the, even the, the motion I have accepted would be tantamount to reconsideration of Article 15, so I cannot allow it. So I can't even allow the 10 feet change. I was actually just going to propose it for this one. I was going to leave the corner lots but, alone. But it becomes, so, yeah. So can I, can I th throw out my reasoning why? No, not the, since we, I'm not going to accept the motion, we will move on. Right, and as well as the one previously. I have to rescind that. Oh, hold on. We may have a change here. Hold on. But we're on a different article. Okay, okay let me we say what's going on. The proposed amendment is now back on the table, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to add something to it. Footnote four needs to be added to the table to make that work. So footnote four makes reference to the five foot um, setback on the corner lots. So, so this will make it 10, but not on a corner lot. So that they're not inconsistent with each other. And now you were proposing a change to 15 feet? Well, what I was proposing is change 15 feet in large part because I'm very concerned about the sight lines on driveways. Um, my, going back to the idea of, you know, ideally we're moving toward having it be more bikeable. Kids, I see kids riding their bikes down there now. My kid might, against my wishes. And I'm thinking that, you know, when a driveway is coming out on that part of the street, it it is so fast, and I, and I guess my question is what kind of sight lines were considered? I did a little research. It takes like 30 to 60 feet for a cyclist, a bike, going 15 miles an hour, which is not fast, 
when they see a car to stop and effectively stop. So I'm looking for the right distance that will avoid, that will not only make a more pleasant walking and cycling experience so people will do it, but also for safety so that we have, um, we consider the sight lines and we don't have a shorter by right setback, a shallower by right setback than will really provide for safety. Um. So I guess I think the beginning of your, your question was why did, you know, how did we get to where we are um, or, or where we originally proposed um, uh, when all the rest are back at 15 or, 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 or more. Um, mixed use developments are complex um, uh, and, you know, they used to do them back in the day. Um, right, that all towns had mixed-use developments. They weren't called mixed-use. It was just it was it was a, a um, commercial property with a, an apartment above. Um, nowadays, there are a lot of requirements that you need to to put in um, elevators. You know, sorts of all sorts of different things, um, standards that weren't there before. Um, it is difficult to do and requires um, a lot of ground space. We want to make sure that um, loading doesn't happen. Uh, in the front on the street and, and all those sorts of things. We want to make sure that there's enough parcel um, uh, that they, that a developer can, can make something work with a residential, all the residential uses and circulations and all the commercial uses and circulations. Is zero the right number? Is 15 the right number? We know that, that 50 is not the right number. Um, about 10, 10 years ago, we, uh, it was 50 foot setback. All everything on Main Street was a 50 foot setback, and that's what we ended up with was all the parking in front. All right, that's that's what we see now, and so we reduced it for many of these developments um, uh, down to, to 15, and what we're or, or 25, it, it sort of depending on what the development type is. Um, and what we're seeing is that that space in the front is not all that functional. Um, and so could we have some, you know, if it was 10 or 15, could there be some um, landscaping in front? Perhaps, but, um, uh, you know, that means it needs to be um, uh, maintained and maintained well. Um, more likely it will be some sort of, um, of hardscape uh, anyways, so that it doesn't it doesn't need to be maintained by the developer, uh, the, by the property owner. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of sight lines, uh, um, what we um, the typically the driveway is not right up against the house, right up against the structure, um, and so you do because there's that set that that distance between the structure and where cars are entering and exiting a, a parcel. There is more. Uh, of a visibility cone from where you where you enter or where someone crosses the street crosses the sidewalk in front of the, the property um, each site's different um, and so that's why we have we have site plan um, but you know uh, what's the right number I don't know Right. We want we wanted to provide flexibility. Uh, and I'd like I guess I'd like to see it bigger and have the flexibility come in terms of negotiating it down if, if the site plan really calls for it. That's my suggestion. Okay, it's gonna get a little confusing, but this is how I will accept these motions. We have a, a motion to amend it to ten feet, and then we have a motion to amend that amendment to fifteen. Uh, I will allow discussion on both the amendment and the amendment to the amendment, but eventually of course we'll vote on them separately. Oh, do we have a second on the proposed amendment to the amendment? Yes. Okay. Further discussion? Yeah, Ms. Webb. Elaine Webb, uh, Precinct 1. I have a question, which I'm um, just trying to understand. Uh, the other night at town meeting, there was discussion about the building where the Sunoco station was in reference to the zero and the five. And I noticed, I drove by, there are brick columns that are what looks to me at what the zero would be, the sidewalk, and then there's a space, and then the building front really starts with the glass windows. It sort of has a nice effect. Um, so I'm wondering, um, that is that, given the change we made to Article 15, would 
the developer be able to do that or would they be an additional five feet back with the brick columns now? The, the um, and I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking this because I, I, I think if, if you drive down Main Street right now, there's a lot of undeveloped properties or unproductive properties. And the point is to, to make them productive. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, when you start talking about five and 10 feet, it might not sound like a lot to us, but it's a huge amount to a developer. So I'm just trying to understand. I think I was led to believe the other night that the building was like right at the zero. And it's actually not, I don't think. I'm, but can you clarify I, that? At part of it, right. Ms. Mercy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Um, portions of that building are at the zero setback, but they did articulate the facade so that it's more interesting and more visually appealing for people driving by it. And that's something that we worked with them through the site plan review and 40 r process, which we would do similarly with any project along South Main Street. Ms. So Webb. I, I'm generally opposed to these amendments and would like to see it kept at five. Um, I think that if, if we want to see Reading develop and have commercial properties that are going to help support the community services that we expect and, and make it thrive, we, we have to do these kinds of things and hopefully, you know, work with the developers that are not 40B developers, but that are developers that you can work with um, and, and create these kind of spaces. Ms. Hillary. Jennifer, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. Can you please explain to me how the mixed use numbers were derived in the first place? Because I'm a little concerned about the lack of, um, I guess, the idea that whether five is the right number, 10 is the right number, 15 is the right number, doesn't make me feel very comfortable voting on this without knowledge. You know, I don't have the background as a town meeting member in the zoning world to really feel properly equipped to make these small changes. So I guess I would like to know how the original numbers were derived. So uh, just to clarify, the reason why I said, you know, I don't know what the right number, um, CPDC's proposal was a zero foot setback. We think that provides the most flexibility for the developers to, to get um, what we want, the town wants, um, and, and what the developer um, needs or wants. Um, uh, but development's always, um, you know, this balancing act. And if the town, if town meeting decides that it's important that we keep a 10 or 15 foot buffer in between, um, in between the, um, the street line, the back of the sidewalk, and any building, that, that's okay. That's what the town would want. They want to make sure that that, 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 that setback is, is there, and developers will figure something out. Um, it may not mean that they have as much flexibility and we, we wouldn't get as much as what we want, the same types of development. Um, but if that's, what we, if that's what we as a town, as town meeting want, we can do that and we can, we can work with that. Uh, CPDC's recommendation is, is a zero foot setback so that we can have uh, that added flexibility, remembering that this is a, um, uh, a, um, a use that's governed by a special permit. Um, and so unlike zoning, the core, you know, the base zoning where we set a, uh, uh, some dimensional controls and we need to live with that. There's no questions if, ifs, ands, or buts. Um, this, we have that flexibility if someone comes in and, and proposes something that is just not acceptable, it can just be, it can just be rejected, which we can't do un, uh, under base zoning. And what, may I ask one follow-up okay. question? Were other mixed use, did you look at other communities that are establishing similar guidelines in mixed use, or was this? It, um, it, we've had um, a number of the uh, folks on the um, CBDC have been over 10 years, um, and we've talked with a number of developers and worked with them um, 
to sort of understand the push and pull specifically, um, specifically in Reading. Some of the problems that we have with development in Reading, especially along South Main Street, are that the, um, the lots are, are pretty small um, and, um, and we have residential development right along um, the back of just about every parcel. And so first and foremost, the thing that we, we want to do is make sure that we aren't encroaching, we aren't imposing on those uh, residential uh, um, abutters. And so that restricts what, um, what we can do. And so we've worked a lot over, over the years with, with, um, with developers that have come in and so they want to do this or that. So um, we didn't necessarily turn to other towns. We took our, um, our experience. That's very helpful, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, uh, Precinct 4. I think that mixed-use development is important. It's environmentally sustainable. It focuses where people live and how much they have to, uh, have to commute, have to move. So I support mixed use. I think in this town we have had some problems because we have not had bylaws like this. And some of the mixed use development has, I don't like to use technical terms, but it's run amok. Um, so I think this is good and I fully support it. I also feel that zero on Route 28 is way too small a setback. I think five is okay. I think five is a minimum. I think 10 is probably okay. I think 15 might be a little too much because even though it's only five feet, we're talking square feet here. So if you multiply that five or 10 by the entire lot size, you're talking about a lot of square feet and you're limiting the flexibility of the developer. I also have tremendous faith in the CPDC and the meetings that have to be held, public meetings for each one of these. And CPDC has the flexibility, has the option of restricting that 10 feet or 15 feet, uh, making it more if the specific case warrants. So I'm in favor of 10 feet and leaving more if CBDC, after they hearing the public, feels it's needed for a specific development. So I think this is good. I think we need to move forward and support mixed development. I think 10 feet is a good number. Mr. Arena. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. Mr. Weston, I'm just looking at the uh, assessor's database online. It looks like for South Main Street, the actual property lines, and again, the, the online may not match the street, but it looks like the the easement sets back at least at 10 feet from what, I, what appears to be the curb on the road. I'm not sure what the setback is on the state highway. Would you know? The, the, um, uh, the property line is generally a foot or two behind the existing back of sidewalk. I had engineering check that before. Um, so before basically RV. the sidewalk plus a foot is where the property line will generally uh, Yeah, generally. Okay. I, right, it changes. It, long, uh, Main Street's, you know, long, so it's, it's not exactly the whole way, but, but in general, yeah, that's And that. I can't see the depth of most of the lots, but they do look rather shallow. Would you happen to know if the top of your head the average lot depth? Ms. Mercier. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mr. Arena, I do not know the answer to that, but that was part of the reason that we made the, um, that we proposed okay. the zero foot setback is because the lots are very shallow and the, especially the business A zoned portion of them right. is very shallow. So there's not a lot of room to work with. Um, and then we did want to pull the building massing first and foremost away from the residential abutters to the rear because when we have had um, site plan reviews at CPDC over the past four years that I've been with the town, that is the number one thing that abutters are concerned about um, is how close proposed structures are to them, um, more so than how close those structures are to the street. So, I mean, speaking from a neighborhood perspective, that would be another reason we would advocate for the zero foot setback. So you have a squeeze. The abutting neighbor doesn't want something right on the line. This would govern the location of the building relative to the street. So you end up with something on some of these lots that might be much more narrower from the offset of both, both effects. Um, Mr. Weston, one of the concerns I've heard here today is what discretion the CPDC might use in, this sets the, this sets the minimum setback, but you'd have the liberty to impose a greater degree. 
what what kinds of principles govern the way the CPDC might view that in the future? And obviously, none of this is governing, but it's just curious to how, how the CPDC might might apply their own judgment at the time. Well, um, the first thing we look at is safety. Um, and so how the building sits on the lot and how the driveway um, interacts with the street and the sidewalk, that's, that's always the very first thing that we, that we look at um, and really sort of reject um, uh, proposals just right out of the, the gun if they, if they um, uh, propose something that we don't think is, um, uh, is safe and usually have a lot of support, <laughs> have a lot of support on that. Um, uh, and then it, it's really about how we, we look at how the buildings interact with the, with the street. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's about how um, we want to make sure there's a front door. Um, That's good. That sounds silly, but um, there's a lot of developments that will come in without front doors um, uh, and, and have that street presence. So it's, it's unlikely that we would ever approve a building with uh, zero setback upon, uh, along the entire um, uh, frontage without some sort of articulation in the building so that it has that street presence so that you can get into the building um, and especially on South Main Street um, where where it's more likely that it's not going to be a structured parking situation where the parking is going to be around um, around the side uh, that could change and you know it depends on the, the development but have some way to circulate into the front of the building we we always want to make sure that the front of the building is a, a main entrance and and from our um, you know from a lot of the recent uh, developments that re that really starts to drive how the building sets um, uh, sets on the the parcel is that s circulation the okay. the entrance of the driveway the circulation into the front door and um, and, and loading um, and making sure that there's loading off the um, right you can't load off a of route 28 so the CPDC is not shy about um, making these judgments and gauging oh, no. to what degree the findings on the plan might alter the minimum conditions in the zoning. You're not shy about applying your own judgments on the fly. Correct. When we have that flexibility, as I mentioned, there's some situations where we, we don't have the flexibility when we're dealing with base yeah. zoning. Um, but yeah, we're not shy about it. I mean, the trouble with any particular number in a chart is it doesn't describe any one particular property. And that's why we have boards, committees, and commissions to help apply common sense and judgment, particularly those that have technical skill like CPDC or um, uh, any of the other boards that deal with compliance issues. I can see all the arguments made here today and I think they all fall on the gambit of how do we make it safe, how do we make it um, workable, and how do we ensure that there isn't any unforeseen circumstance. But the only way I know how to do that is to put faith in our boards, committees, and commissions to make the right call on the ground. Because doing it today in 2019 doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what happens in five or ten years. So my tendency would be to put this at the five-foot level and um, expect that CPDC would use that freedom judiciously and expect to pull it back to 10 or 15 as circumstances or neighbors or conditions dictate. So, thank you. Thanks. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Brown, Precinct 8. I just uh, guess I have a couple of questions. Any business that goes into these lots, uh, they are under no obligation whatsoever to plant anything green whatsoever. Is that correct? Um, obligation, no. Um, There's no way though, we can make them plant. Though, plant as plants. right the, again, this is a part of a uh, site plan review. Um, we um, we typically I don't want to say uh, always because right, it's it's different for each site, but um, typically require. Um, uh, them to put some sort of landscaping in, some sort of greenery in. And do you know which they'd prefer, landscape or tarmac, depending on which is cheaper? Um, I, you know, a, a developer puts a lot of money into, um, in, into a building. They gen typically want to make it look nice um, and, and adding trees and grass and some sort of um, uh, landscaping usually 
does make it look nice. Um, how you actually end up doing that, whether it's whether it's you know five ten feet of grass versus um, uh, some trees and some landscaping and some some um, uh, planters, it, it really it, that that's part of the the art of it all. Okay, and I guess my last question is, uh, I'm not sure you can answer this. Uh, I've seen a lot of properties where that was the intention, but the plants themselves don't get watered and they die and then they look pretty hideous. Uh, so I guess what, besides it, looking nice, what's the incentive to maintain? In our, in our site plan review, in our site plan decisions, we typically have some, um, uh, some language in there about maintenance of landscaping. Um, that's uh, honestly, that's good for the first couple of years um, and if they come back um, and need something else from the town but you know once it gets on to five six seven years and they're not they're not maintaining their landscaping we don't have much leverage over them to to require them to water their lawn or um, if that's so, what it is we want them to do so where the discussion mr berman thank you mr moderator barry berman precinct four um, I think more important than the front setbacks are the rear setbacks. Because if you think about um, all of the comments that we got from uh, people who live on Green Street with that development, Lincoln Street with that development, um, those projects really went almost to the back line. Um, and I see what you're doing here is doing a 20-foot setback for the rear to address those concerns. My fear is if you have a 20 foot setback and now you're adding 10 or 15, you're basically making this lot unbuildable and it's going to defeat the entire purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, Ms. Mercia, you had said that the Sunoco building, that, that project is a, is a zero setback? Ms. Mercia? If I'm not mistaken, I believe it is, yes. Okay, so, and clearly there's a sidewalk there that in addition to, to that. So um, and I also have a fear that if it's 5 or 10 or 15, it's not going to be usable space and it'll wind up being, like Mr. Weston said, just you know, planted stuff that looks great for a year and then dies and then it, it, look, and it, and it looks horrible. Um, the question that I have is that if we actually go back to what you had proposed, which is a zero foot setback, um, do you have then the discretion on a project by project basis to say, you know what, does it, make it, does it make it sort of as of right that that developer can go right to that lot line, or do you still have discretion to make it five or, five or 10? Based on that project, based on you know, sort of where it is on Main Street, et cetera. Ms. Mercier. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Berman. That's a great question. Um, through the special permit process, everything is discretionary, so we would be able to work with them. So if it says zero, if we leave it at zero, you can then say, you know what, I know it says zero, but for this project, we need it to be five or 10, or maybe 15. Is yes. that true? I believe so, yes. Then I think, I, and I'm not gonna support either of these motions. I think that we have a great, we have a great board with great expertise, and that you could fig, you know, you can figure out what makes sense. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna waste all of this time putting in a zoning amendment that's trying to encourage development that just makes it impossible to do so because we put too many restrictions on it. I think you guys have the, you know, the, the, the wherewithal, the thought process to kind of look at this project by project rather than us trying to sort of blanket proposal what mixed use looks like on every single parcel because each project's gonna be different. So if that's the case, if we have that flexibility, I, I think we should leave it at zero. Thank you. In the far corner, yes. Good evening, Michael Giacalone, Precinct 5. Um, I absolutely agree with what Mr. Berman just said. Um, I'm not a developer. A lot of thought was put into this process from the people who are in this department. They had set it at zero. There's that flexibility to move things around. I'm concerned about unintended consequences. By setting these types of things, I don't know how many people here are developers and, and understand these things, but we heard so many comments already about making these setbacks walkable reading, whatever it is they're looking for, you have no guarantee of what's going to be there. The sidewalks are the sidewalks. I don't think we can change those sidewalks. Is that correct? 
Correct. That's that's okay, nice so yeah. whether you have the building at zero, you have a five feet, 10 feet, 50 feet, there's no, that's not going to make it usable space. The people are still going to be using the sidewalks. And if we discourage a developer from coming in because this distance has made it not productive for them to put a building in, we're going to potentially um, uh, prevent the very thing we're trying to encourage. And now we'll have nothing. If you make these things, you've already said, I don't know how many times, we have no control over what they do with the space. And now it looks unattractive, it looks um, decrepit, and again, you've gone against the very thing you're trying to achieve. Um, these unintended consequences, if you've ever done your house over, one inch can make a huge difference in a project just on our home. And here we are just trying to decide five feet, 10 feet, I heard 15 feet. Um, for goodness sake, you're gonna have one of these tiny little houses now on this lot, and it's not going to be in value to anybody. I'm opposed to this change, and I prefer to have it set back to zero, as the CPD said, and have them work with the developers and make that flexibility to make that project as viable as possible and control it from that perspective. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. It would seem from the discussion that we're, in fact, allowing reconsideration without a motion for reconsideration when we talk about zero. The amendment was 10 and the proposed amendment to 15, so I think we kind of like went astray here, and I'm really unhappy with the fact that it seems like the it was not accepted by CPTC's chair and the staff person that, in, f in fact, that was the, the, the vote, you know, last Thursday. Also, I want to say that just if you want to take, you know, an example, you know, and CPTC membership is great now, but it changes. It turns over. We don't know what's going to happen five years from now, ten years from now, staff changes over and everything else. But look at the exit to the CVS parking lot onto Haven Street. With the zero setback, I'm someone who when I go downtown, I'm always walking, or at least like 95% of the time. I can't tell you how many times I've almost been hit by a car coming out because there's no sight line and they don't care, they're just gonna come right out. If you don't have a sight line, so I'm saying, you know, we talked about five foot. I don't think that's, you know, you know I'm not talking about 10 or 15 or anything else, but I would at least hope that we would have stayed with the, the five foot and don't talk any further about, you know, or don't make, we can talk about it, but don't make any move to reconsider what we did last Thursday. Thank you. Further discussion, right, uh, yes, um, just behind Ms. Doctor, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Nick Boyvin, uh, Precinct 7. So I have two things uh, to say, one about the amendment and one about the amendment to the amendment. And they both follow from the previous comments, I think. My impression as to the amendment is that this was intended as a technical fix, I would call it, to make changes that were consistent with what we voted on last week and not do anything more. Is that a fair assessment of how this was introduced? to the mover of the, of the original Ms. amendment. Ms. Marcia. So to clarify what's happening here and why I put the five up on the screen um, under front yard setback for business A, for mixed use, was to um, acknowledge that I heard the conversation that happened last Thursday. However, the vote last Thursday on Article 15 pertained to structures on corner lots. So it did not necessarily contemplate simply just across the board the front yard setback for any property that redevelops as a mixed use project in business A. So perhaps that was my error that I put that up there. Um, but so I do believe zero probably is still on the table in this instance. So this goes beyond what this body voted on last Thursday night. That's the intention of it? Does, do these amendments go beyond what this body voted on last Thursday night? 
um, what the body voted on um, uh, with the change to the five foot was just on oh, that change um, was just on corner lots. So it, this does go um, beyond. And what so we voted this, on. what we're talking about now, addresses all those parcels that aren't necessarily co corner lots. Okay. And so this, that's my basis for being uncomfortable with the amendment as a whole is that this is a complicated issue. We've heard a lot of views. Um, we had a full discussion last Thursday night. We voted on one piece of zoning ordinance. We now have changes being presented here that weren't in the warrant. They're, they're, they're on the topic of the warrant. They're not outside the scope, but they're very detailed. They're very specific. They go beyond what we talked about Thursday night. I would be more comfortable with having a separate day, a separate discussion on this. As to the amendment to the amendment, my final point, um, I, I'm uncomfortable with making changes on the fly here without having a fuller discussion of the, of the entire uh, amendment. So I'm opposed to both the amendment to the amendment because I, I, I think just the comments I've heard have made it unclear to me that this is the right course of action. And I'm uncomfortable with the original amendment because I think it effectively reopens discussion on something this body talked about last time. It's outside what was presented in the warrant papers. I'd like to see it in writing before we uh, vote on it as a town. Thanks. Ms. Dockham. Uh, Nancy, Dr. Precinct 1, the only thing I'm going to say is please remember what we did to Spence Farm and what we have there now because of all of the changes that this body wanted to make to developers. So I'm not going to support either of these um, amendments. Mr. Brown. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Um, if a gentleman came in and said, the hell with that, I'm going to build a 40B, what would be the consequences? He could build right up to the street, right? Um, this has nothing to do with 40B. I, I know that, but let's say, theoretically, he, he doesn't want to do a mixed use. Yeah. If he says, I'm going to build a 40B on that site, he can build right up to the street line, right? Ms. Mercy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Brown. At such time that the town is subject again to the 40B process, a 40B can go in any zone in town and could can disregard local zoning regulations, including dimensional setbacks. Okay, thanks. That's what I was getting at. So if we go for 10 feet, 15 feet, and he says, hell with that, I'm going with 40B, he can put it right up to the street and the heck with the street lines. Further discussion on the proposed amendments, Mr. Sasso? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, I just, a couple things. First of all, just to clarify, so the limit you're putting in here actually in some respects is more of a marketing tool than anything else because under the special permit process, you can, in fact, waive it. You, what we approved on um, Monday night, uh, excuse me, Thursday night, allowed us to ex have exceptions to that particular paragraph that define the, the dimensional controls, correct? Correct, correct. So, um, I mean, I think, again, to, to some of the other folks that have spoken, we're trying here to um, provide, you, provide you flexibility, which, again, based on what we approved already, this is just a guideline. You still have the authority within the, within the um, bylaw, within the mixed-use bylaw that you just, we just approved to uh, waive and exempt yourself from these requirements. Um, so the other reason to keep it... Um, well, the, the, the footnote four is what gives you the five foot, because um, again, that's only specifically related to corners. Um, so you could actually put this back to zero and still be in compliance with that part of the bylaw that you um, agreed to, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendments? Yes, Mr. Bonazzoli. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James Bonzoli, Precinct 6. Um, so I am in favor of this. And the reason I'm in favor is, um, John, as, as you said last week, you know, we're thinking 10, 20 years down the road. And I'd like the intent of this body to resonate 20 years from now. So when I look at, you know, South Main Street, and if it ends up looking like that building on Main Street, and I hope we, this drives a lot of development and every property is built. My concern is that if every property is built that looks like that, it's a wall of building right up to the street. 
So I think by having the intent of visually, we want a setback. Now, whether that's at the street or we change the language further down, that as the building rises, you're getting a, a visual setback. I don't know what the answer is on that. But um, I am in favor of this because I, I do feel that being right up, in, up against the street, if you have a 55, 45 story building, uh, 45. it's a huge wall. Right. My question for you is 60% coverage doesn't seem to apply correctly. If I'm doing the math on, on most properties, right? If we have zero and then a 10 foot, it's either a very small piece of property. How is the 60% coverage? The 60% uh, uh, the you, you can't take the the um, the setbacks and wind up with 60%, right? That's not the way that 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 works. What we wanted to do is make sure that um, it is that some development doesn't come along and um, l like may be appropriate in downtown where there's where there's um, much greater coverage of a of a unit. Right. This is a recognition that uh, that South Main Street is is not downtown Reading. Um, uh, and that the full lot should not be um, the, should not be a hundred percent building. There should be well, there has to be some some parking. There should be some um, some landscaping, some greenery. Um, that it's not it's it's not the full parcel. Um, okay, so that won't go away. Or I mean, obviously, it's a special permit. It could go away, but to some extent, you're going to try to honor as much right, as that. Right. Possible. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Are people who have not spoken yet? Mr. Coco? Thank you, Mr. Moderator Richard Coco, Precinct 4. I'm going to change from the setback discussion. I'm looking at Matt. Well, we're building. talking about the setback right now, that we're, we're discussing the proposed amendments. Well, then, then, Mr. Moderator, can I focus ourselves on note two? Note two seems to give you no control over the, so the height of any of these structures. Note two. Yeah, I think that's a different. It, it's that's wide open. But you're talking about the height. We're talking about the setbacks right now. Yeah. I understand that, Mr. Moderator. I would bring up the question with number two, because there doesn't seem to be any control on the maximum height of these non-human human occupancy structures. Right. Well, I will get back to you when we are discussing that. We okay, right? so I, I can yeah. raise my hand again? Yes. Thank yes. you. So if I can, yes. um, note two, right, note two is in our, um, is in our um, table. It wasn't part specifically of uh, mixed use. Uh, the addition oh, it's already in the table. It's yes. just it's zoning. It's in the zoning table. Okay. So, um, I, I, so probably I, not within. Sure. The, I, I wasn't the, even looking at that. I was trying to stick for state of the subject. But you, you're correct. That would be out of the scope of this article, Mr. Coco. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Linda Snow, Doxer, Precinct 1. I just would like some clarification. I'm looking at the yard 6.2.2 and how this interacts with the setback conversation. So that talks about residence districts. Um, but my question is about um, eaves, cornices, bay windows, windowsills. Does that extend to also balconies and how does that work with setbacks? Like if I don't want um, balconies hanging over sidewalks, and, but they're not attached to the ground, so I just want to make sure that the gross floor area of the building doesn't imply that you know, things in the air don't count, but I, I just would love some uh, clarification on that. Thank you. Ms. Mercier. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Doxer. So the building commissioner typically looks at closest point of structure when determining setbacks. Um, 
And so especially with buildings that have a zero foot setback, um, we, would, we would consider um, projections from that building that may overhang the public sidewalk and even footings that go underground. Um, some buildings have had to be stepped back you know, after they've been approved um, to account for footings that go under the public sidewalk. So we do look at those things. Further discussion on the proposed amendments? Yes. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I agree with Mr. Arena, Mr. Berman, and a few other speakers. Um, by setting these setbacks, we're limiting um, developers' options and willingness to come into this town and do something about it. Um, we are growing as a town. Um, it's apparent we need new classroom space. Um, we're getting three new portables, um, and that's going to be short-lived. We're going to have to really make um, essentially almost a new elementary school. Um, the superintendent talked about all the schools are at capacity right now, so we need to encourage growth, um, smart growth, and we do have uh, very good boards and everything else to to monitor that by setting a, a 10, 15 foot setback um, on these sites. We're really limiting developers' options um, to what they can do. We're limiting square footage. We're limiting tax revenue um, possibilities in the future. So, uh, you know, it's my opinion we, we need to do this smartly, but I agree with the zero foot setback. Um, and, you know, or else, you know, two years from now, we can have another uh, Proposition two and a half discussion, or we can, you know, maybe open up Memorial Park to a field of portables for our additional classroom space. Um, the reality is we're going to need it. And the, the need is now. So we have to encourage developers to come in here and rely on our boards um, to do the right thing. And I think we have uh, very talented uh, boards to do that. That's, that's my Thank opinion. You. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Joe Carnahan, Precinct 6. Uh, could we please, I'd like to move the question, this discussion of these amendments. Uh, you're moving the question on proposed amendments or the entire, okay. We have a motion to uh, move the question on the proposed amendments. Is there a second? Second. All right, this requires a two-thirds vote. I think I have three of my four counters. Uh, point of order? Both. They, the, all of the, 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 the amendments and the amendment to the amendment. We're, we're asking to end debate on those two amendments. Another point of order? Five. That was the motion, the main motion. Okay. We will start, with, well, we have to take the vote on the uh, ending debate first, but we will start with amending the amendment, which would change 10 to 15. Regardless of how that goes, we then have to vote on the, the original amendment, either as originally proposed or now amended. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, oh. So this is for 15 or 5? This is for ending debate. Okay. debate then I will explain it one more time. Um, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown, do you, do you want to take the, um, the right and the, um, the finance committee? Uh, we are voting on ending debate. Hold on. vote on ending debate on the two proposed amendments. Mr. Brown, could you take your section and the Finance Committee? Mr. Crook, could you take the right? Ms. Hillary, could you take the left here? And I think I'm missing my counter over here. Um, uh, Mr. Robinson, can I impose on you to count the left and the, the select board? All right, all those in favor of ending debate on the two proposed amendments, please rise.
Forty. How, excuse me. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. And those opposed to ending debate. Three. <laughs> Two. Two. Six. Six. Two. Two. The vote being 136 to 13, we have ended debate. Now, let me explain what we are going to do. We had a motion to change the number of five to ten. But then we had a, a second proposed amendment to change ten to fifteen. So first we will vote on the proposed change from ten to fifteen. And regardless how that goes, we will then go back and vote on the original Point of order, Mr. proposed amendment, excuse me, which would either be 10 or 15, depending on how this vote goes. Now, was there a point of order? Barry Berman, my book says zero. So Right, but the, the, the um, motion made tonight on the screen was five. Uh, I thought the motion was for 10 and then the other one was for 15. No, the original motion was for five which was, even though your book says zero, they explained at the beginning they were making the motion tonight as five to match what we did on 15. But, so but, the mo main motion is at five. We have a proposed amendment to change it to 10, and then a proposed change to the amendment to 15. But Mr. Moderator, um, what we voted on the other night was for side lots. That was for five. But I'm sorry, um, the corner lots? Corner lots, correct. But this is for the entire... Exactly. So. That doesn't mean we're starting at five. We're going back to start at no, seven. No, we're starting at five because the motion that was made on Article 16 tonight. It was? Five. It must yes. have been a long yeah. time ago. I didn't remember that. <laughs> it was a long time okay. ago. <laughs> Another point of order? Yes, Mr. Arena. With all due respect, Mr. Moderator, I think the proposal to vote on 10 versus 15 and then the outcome of that voted as zero versus five, you run the risk of confusing. I don't, my only suggestion for a better outcome is stand for the, if, it, if the first motion fails, are the, are the winners, if the first motion passes, are the winners of that first motion to be denied if the second motion also passes? No, this is what will happen. We will vote on the change from 10 to 15. If that passes, we then still have to vote on the amendment as now amended, which would be 15. So effectively, we'd be taking a second vote on the same thing, but it's, it's not really. But you're presupposing that those that would have picked 10 or 15 might not have also picked five. That's my only point. There well, then, then once, it's, once we have handled the amendment to the amendment, either at 10 or 15, you still have another chance to vote it down, which would mean it would go back to five. But my point is if it passes, it's ambiguous whether what the outcome it would have really been with three choices. I, I don't have a better choice other than saying a show of hands for any particular value. But otherwise, it's prejudicial, I believe. Well, right now, we have a motion to change it to 10 and then a motion to change that to 15. So we're going to vote on the change from 10 to 15 first. And regardless of how that goes, we will then vote Again, either for the, the original 10, if, if this first vote fails, or 15, if, if this vote carries. Yes. <laughs> this is not all that complicated. <laughs> uh, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Jonathan Barnes. Um, I'm still confused about how we got from zero to five. Okay. When the main motion was made on Article 16, it had five in it. No matter what your book says, the motion was made with five That's in it. That's also not on the screen. It was... I don't know how to do that. When we made the motion... Who made the motion to go from zero to five? When, when, we, oh, introduced, the maker. when we introduced the motion, Thank the, the first part of the night, we, um, we put in five to try and reflect um, uh, the discussion, the long discussion that we had on Thursday night. So that's where, that's where we started the motion. Okay, so we started with five. We have a proposal to change it to 10 and a proposal to change that to 15. So uh, we have ended debate, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> we will now vote on the proposed amendment to the amendment, which would change that number from 10 to 15. This requires a majority vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. 
And those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We now have the original proposed amendment, which changes to 5 to 10. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We now have a main motion with five in it again, and we are open to discussion on the main motion. Yes, Mr. Halsey. John Halsey, Precinct 1. Um, I'm, the question I'd like to ask, is it commonplace for us to receive our warrant and then without discussion, without motion, unilaterally change it from the podium? Is that, is yeah. that commonplace for yes, us to do the that? Warrant, the warrant includes articles, which is the broad subject. A motion is made within that article. So the motion doesn't have to say what the article says. It just has to be within the confines of that article. Well, uh, you know, I, I think people prepare in a certain way based on the book of warrants that we receive. And for that to be changed on the fly seem, without discussion seems, uh, you know, a little inappropriate. But if it's appropriate, fine. I, I would suggest that <clears throat> that unilateral change that was made without discussion on this particular topic be reconsidered back to its original form at zero and then open the discussion from there. I would accept I make that, that as a motion. I would accept that as a motion. But, th but you have to remember, the motion that they make is the motion that they make. So if you want to propose to change that. So have you, have you made that motion? OK, we have a proposed amendment to change 5 to 0. Is there a second? Second. second. And did we have discussion on that? Mrs. Webb, did you? Or were you just seconding? Second. OK. Uh, further discussion on changing the 5 to 0. Mr. O'Neill. General O'Neill, Precinct 4. I'm opposed to the amendment to the motion uh, because my understanding is with the five, just as the argument was made before, you still would be able to grant a variance or a special permit for it to be back to zero if, in fact, you came upon this perfect development you know, proposal that had all sorts of counterbalancing sort of things. Is that correct? All right. So in fact, it would not inhibit you from, from doing so. All, would, all it would mean is the person would, ha the developer would have to make the case. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, and I apologize for making the change. I did have the approval of the moderator and uh, CPDC chair to put the five in there before tonight's discussion. but. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, do we have a, up on the phone? Yes. Michael Giacalone, Precinct 5. Um, which is more challenging, for this to be zero and for CPDC to tell the developer they have to move it back, or to have it some value and for someone to try to come and ask for a variance to move it up? Well, uh, they wouldn't have to ask for a variance, right? So this is a special permit, so they can come in with a, with a proposal. If it's at uh, five, um, that's what they're going to assume they need to go to do when they start their, their design process. Um, and then they'll need to, uh, to ask for a waiver um, to, to get it up to, to get it down to zero. Um, and is that more challenging to do than for you folks to tell them they have to push it back? Um, and the reason why I ask is all about unintended consequences. No, I, yeah, I understand. I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, um, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. I'm, I'm not sure. There, right, there's so many different variables on on whether we whether we want them to come come in with something and push a push against them to try and get what we want, or we want them to come in. You know, it's it sort of it's it's how that whole um, uh, process un, unwraps. And, um, and, and, and I'm my, not sure which is better. And my thought on the unintended consequences again: if we put these restrictions on the developer. And now this project is pushed back. You're going to have people in the residential area saying, now this is coming too close. 
and there's going to be issues with that. Mm -hmm. And now that gets pushed forward or, or whatever changes. Yeah. And then the developer yeah. says, I'm out of here. And then as Mr. Brown said, a 40B comes in because we, yes, we're in this moratorium, but it doesn't last forever. And now we're out of that moratorium or whatever that um, uh, uh, safety harbor that we're in right now. And now the 40B comes in and nobody can say anything to this thing and they get something they absolutely never ever wanted and they can't say anything about it. So I think if the control is in your hands to be able to say, well, you want to come forward, but no, you have to go back with your jurisdiction, I think that has to be a better outcome. Further discussion on the proposed amendment, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I don't think there's any need for an apology from the staff on this. this I, I, I personally did expect to see this because I think it was a message I took from town meeting discussion and vote on Thursday night that this is uh, more like a guideline. This is an, uh, an indication to developers that we are interested in some space, some buffering, some landscaping. It's not um, punitive. It's just, this is what we like as a community, and this is what we want for the visuals. And it is waivable. And even in 40Bs, they're not guaranteed a zero. And we're not, you know, and if we, and this also sort of, I don't know how to describe it, like derivative, like we put in the landscape in 10 years, it's going to look terrible. That's not true. We have a lot of nice places that stay. If they, you know, have committed owners that it, there's pride in the community, it looks good. So just to say it's an either or, it's, it's I'm very unhappy with this discussion. Um, there's also, while I, while I agree on South Main that there's some narrow lots, there's also some that are not. So you think about the Lashies development. That's a very wide lot. Um, and some of the others down there. So it's a mix as, as it is throughout the community. It's a mix of some abut, you know, conservation, some abut um, residential. Some are narrow, some are not. So I think it's more, what do we want as a streetscape going down the road in the future? And I think a five is the minimum, a sense that, yes, we want a sense of space and green as we drive down the street. I hope that we will um, uh, keep to the five. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, Mr. Moderator, isn't this, in effect, a motion to reconsider our vote from last time? No, that concerned corner lots. This is not. I, I actually thought that, too, when I first saw it, but it's not. It's a different... I, 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 yes, technically that's true, but yes. isn't the spirit of what was voted on last time, isn't that what is being reconsidered? Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Just uh, one question. Um, Mr. Weston, does th this, this issue of the required front yard, does whether it's a zero or five or ten, does that impact the, the question of how uh, a, uh, a potential applicant would, or how the, the CPDC uh, would consider uh, where and how the parking is situated on these properties? Does it, does it matter to a developer uh, whether it's five feet or ten feet in terms of where the parking is situated, and, and do, do you care? Um, uh, zero feet or five feet? Um, uh, no, probably not. I mean, right, you, you're not going to be able to use that space for, for parking, so uh, they're going to have to put it to the side or to the back. So the difference between zero and five is, you know, no, someone's not going to come in and use that space for, for, um, for vehicular circulation. Um, they, you know, pedestrian circulation, yeah, it, it may have impact that one way or another. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, in the far corner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fausto Garcia, Precinct 3. Um, I just would like to address the board with a, a simple question as to why the five was put in originally when it was proposed. What was your thinking behind putting in the five? Well, uh, let's clarify this. 
what we voted on, what CPDC voted on was zero. Mm -hmm. Is that the question? Uh, but then at the beginning of, of tonight, right. we included um, five because, um, uh, because of the discussion um, that happened on Thursday night. Um, it, it appeared like that was the um, that was the, the feeling of the of town meeting of, of what they what they wanted um, was okay. five feet um, a five feet setback okay. um, regardless that's, now that's that's different than what was actually voted on right five correct. feet setback was was um, okay. that was voted on Thursday was just to discuss the corner lots so in the effort to try and move this um, uh, zoning does discussion along <laughs> we thought that we would change it to five feet because um, uh, I thought that's what what um what okay. we had heard so from, um, from a design <laughs> standpoint is there any advantage to keeping it all five feet you know five feet on the frontage and the corner if you know if there is a lot that's placed that way Probably not. Ms. Mercier Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, w I was thinking about this just now, and there's probably not a huge difference, um, whether it's zero or whether it's five. But, you know, if it's, well, I'm not going to say anything else. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2 again. Um, developers look at gross leasable area when they look at the feasibility and the profitability of a project. And that five feet, if people think they're going to get a lush garden, they're really going to get hardscape, maybe additional sidewalk, maybe a planter or two. Um, they're looking at how they can maximize their profit. And also, that five feet over the height width of the building is also going to, um, if we limit them to that, it's going to reduce the tax revenue. So if you want a couple planters and additional hardscape, for the most part, unless you know the building committee mandates a lush garden in front, that five feet really isn't going to make a difference, but it is going to discourage development in that area. That, that area is a diamond in a rough. It's not really doing anything right now for us as a town. Um, so I would like, again, I'll say it again, I'd still like to keep it at zero and encourage good smart development in those areas. They're not wide lots. Some are wider than others, but we can't apply one, we can't limit ourselves to one lot, considering only one lot. We have to look at the whole thing and then use the board's discretionary judgments for those other lots that may have the capability to be profitable for these developers, an asset to the town, and, and give us that extra buffer when we need it. But we don't want to put ourselves in a box and, and limit it to, to an earlier gentleman's point when it was 50 well look what happened we have a dead zone I say we open it up and use our discretion properly it'll be harder it'll be more discouraging if the developer has to come in and seek a variance on a zoning bylaw than to come in and work with our building committee and come up with a good frontage scheme that works for everyone Thank you. Ms. Downey. Thank you, Marianne Downing, Precinct 3. I support um, the five and what Mrs. O'Neill was saying. And I had a, um, a question related to this, though. Mixed use is not mandatory in business A, right? The business A zoning still applies if we had someone want to come and build 100% commercial. Correct. And that setback is 15 feet, Correct. if I'm reading. So in the alternate, with mixed use, someone's coming in with a token 25% of business and really 75% of residential. And we're, we're worried about them not wanting to do that when we're only requiring five feet. If they don't like that, they could, they could build what, frankly, I would rather have on South Main, which is more businesses with the and they would be willing to work with the 15 feet setback. So I think people here are worried about turning away businesses and we're gonna regret this and we're gonna get 40 Bs, but if the businesses really wanted to be a business, they could already be doing that. What we're doing here is we're, 
approving a new residential setback, essentially, right, with like 25% business. We're going to end up with less business on a site that currently has, is all business, right? Well, that's the one thing that, I don't know if you were here on, on Thursday night, but really one of the principles that we are sticking to is making sure that that 25% of the, of the development is, um, is commercial. Um, and so, so on a four-story building, that's the ground floor. Um, and what we, um, we are hearing and, and what town staff is hearing um, and, and we understand is really the um, investment now is coming um, in the form of mixed use. Um, and so that's what we won't really want to do. We want to encourage investment no, I, in I our town. And so, and so yes, that. could someone come in and build a commercial development, you know, one story commercial development um, on a property um, along Main Street with a 15 foot setback? Yep. yep. But, they, you know, we're having this other discussion, as, as other people have said, with crowded schools and modulars, mm -hmm. and now we're bringing in on all of these business lots 75% housing. So we just want to keep that in mind. I'm not really that worried about, you know, I, I, I agree with the five foot nice streetscape. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make the, make a, remind everybody that but we won't be driving away if someone really wants to put a business in. They still have a fifth, they can still come. And there's, yeah. Even a better setback, setback for the businesses. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Herrick? Uh, I would just like, Steve Herrick, uh, Precinct 8. I would just like to uh, voice my support of the five foot setback. I'm, it's never, this body amazes me sometimes. We went through a very vigorous discussion last Thursday on the merits of a five-foot setback on the corners, and I think every discussion we have is completely pertinent to this evening. Um, same impact, really. The, the option for a zero setback uh, can be justified to, to the zoning board or the CPDC. We were asked to approve that, and I'm sure that they'll use their judgment wisely. Um, going to a zero uh, setback along the, um, all of South Main Street I think we shouldn't think about this in terms of a 20-year time horizon. I think we should think about this in terms of an 80-year, 100-year time horizon, a time after which pretty much everybody in this room, I'm sure, will be gone. Um, you're talking about building the character of a street, and I think that putting 45 feet is, is the maximum. There's really no pushback on that. That's it's built into the zoning. I don't, there's no discussion of changing that. Putting 45-foot buildings with a zero setback all up and down Main Street. Uh, I'd try to imagine exactly what that means. I mean, it's, talk, it's, it's a very different street than we have today. And I think if you look around at streets that you like, st streets in other towns that you think are, um, are well designed, are livable, uh, places where people want to be, you'd see that a, a, a slot of 45 feet high on each side, right up against the sidewalks, is not really the kind of livable, um, maybe it'll be the city of Reading in the future, the megatropolis of Reading. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's really what we envision. That's not the legacy we want. We're giving ourselves flexibility here to uh, accommodate developers. I don't think we're impinging upon the ability to be profitable. In fact, I think that by maintaining the character of that end of town, encouraging uh, smart growth, uh, growth that is livable, uh, has sun, has space, has setbacks. I think we're creating a much more viable commercial environment, much more livable town for the future. That's my opinion. I saw a hand up in the back. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeffrey Crime, Precinct 7. I would like to move the question. We and have many get, more things to on the amendment. Okay, we have a second. Okay. Uh, this is a motion to end debate on the um, amendment to go from uh, five to zero. Uh, do I have my same counters? I do. All those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Twenty-one. Forty-three. 
34. 34. And those opposed to ending debate? Well, if you have an excuse for all that. Two. Two. Thirteen. Thirteen. Five. Five. And who am I missing? Oh. <laughs> Three. Point of order. I will try to keep that in mind. Although, uh, see, the vote is 122 in the affirmative. 23 in the negative. The question has been moved. So we are now voting. There is an amendment to change 5 to 0. So if you vote yes, you are changing the number to 0. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Uh, please raise your hand. Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. And those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We now go back to the main motion with 5 as the number. Further discussion on the main motion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Um, just, a, I guess, a procedural question. Did the full CPDC vote on changing that number from uh, 0 to 5? No. Shouldn't they have, since it's the recommendation of the CPDC? No idea. Do we have an opinion from the uh, Town Council? <laughs> <laughs> Would have been a good question to have last time. <laughs> we gave the CPDC report. zero. Right. If we read the CPDC. Then they shouldn't have made the change, Bill. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mr. Remiaris, I'll let you finish first. Okay, point of order. Um, it was this body that recommended that on Thursday. We voted on because, corner lots. Corner lots. Excuse only, me, one at a time. Not the full Because time. on Thursday it was said, after this vote, we will need to change Article 16 to reflect what was just discussed. And we all agreed to that, and we moved forward. I didn't vote on that. Mr. Meares. So the person who's making the motion in this case, the chairman, of the chairman of the CPDC has the discretion to make whatever motion he thinks is appropriate. It would be misleading if he had said this was the recommendation of the CPDC, but he had already read the report and has repeated several times today that the, that the um, recommendation of the CPDC was zero. So. Um, there's nothing inappropriate with, as far as town meeting procedure goes for him to make the motion that he deemed to be um, most appropriate. And I would add that the, cha that the chair would add that we, the body did have the choice to put it back to zero. Okay, for, uh, where were we? Th further discussion on the main motion? None appearing. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion as amended, please rise. No, because they um, that Oh, there were none that passed, you're right. So at the main motion. Twenty five. But it doesn't need to be twenty five. Twenty five. 43. 38. 38. 25. 25. And those opposed? One. One. Zero. Zero. Three. Twelve. Twelve. The vote being 131 in the affirmative and 16 in the negative, the motion carries. And that brings us back to Article 4. Uh, 
Mr. Lelesha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Michelle Sanfi, if you've lost your debit card, we have it up front here. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Best part of town meeting. Nobody left. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town meeting members. <clears throat> Article four is to amend the current year's budget. I'll go. I'll go through these um, one at a time, somewhat quickly. I'm certainly open for questions. We have a surplus in health insurance premiums. Uh, unions and myself negotiated beyond the town meeting last April, so we ended up again having a very successful negotiation. Initially, that 149,000 was a number picked to balance the budget, except for capital. So it's somewhat of a random number. Um, capital, as amended, you see there for over two million dollars is what was discussed in Article Three. Um, I had mentioned in passing, but now you see the number, that some of the reason for some of that capital was we were uh, deferring debt repayments. Town meeting had voted for a debt budget that is $750,000 higher than we needed. If we had borrowed in May or June, by law, we would have needed to make a principal payment within 12 months. We did not borrow in that period of time. We still have not borrowed. We expect to borrow this winter, but there will be no principal repayment so that this is just a, a, a placeholder for what the principal repayment would have been. And we felt in order to keep in, in current with FinCom's 5% debt and capital that we would substitute in at least $750,000 of capital to take its place. The 750,000 of debt repayments will happen in the end of a debt. So if it's a 10 year bond, it now happens in year 11. <clears throat> Two items for public services under expenses. There's a Birch Meadow design that's a request by the Recreation Committee. And there's an open space plan, which was last done in 2013. The last time it was done, the town manager formed a working group that included conservation and recreation. Um, as yet, we don't have a specific plan going forward, but the reason that this action is necessary or, or suggested tonight is the town is eligible for grants through March of 2020. If we do not start this process, we could lose that eligibility for grants. Uh, there's a couple of suggestions under line J92 public safety ex expenses, the big one being to buy three police cruisers, which was the intention of the budget. We were off by about $12,000 each. That's how much police cruisers have gone up. Uh, I understand some of that has to do with tariffs. I think honestly some of it was just the equipment is more expensive than, than the department had realized. It's a couple smaller items. Um, <clears throat> we need to actually pay a doctor now um, to be an EMD dispatch doctor. That's someone obviously not in our pay and it's just a small amount. The fire department received um, a significant grant, but there is a local match of 6,000. That's to buy uh, washing machines in both fire stations. Um, as you can imagine, in the fire science, uh, washing gear after a fire is significantly more important than what was once thought to be after being exposed to smoke and other chemicals. Uh, and lastly, there's a public safety need for um, some school plans. Um, we call them police plans here. They're called a be safe. Um, it's just to have uh, full documents available uh, on call that have to be updated annually um, from a public safety standpoint. The Town Forest Committee has a revolving fund that you've approved for a few years. They have not yet sold timber, so there is no balance in it. Um, they are requesting as much as $25,000 to get that thinning project started. Um, it's possible they may spend the 25000 but from what I've heard, it's also quite likely they will spend less. And they may or may not get any revenue from timber they would sell. There's just no way to know that at this point. So the net operating expenses of all that put together um, are really less than the capital. Um, you know, the, the capital dominates those numbers. 
There's a small adjustment made on the revenue side for new growth and from state assessments. So there's a net use of just over a million and a half for free cash proposed. As was mentioned in Article 3, uh, there are a few capital changes to the enterprise funds, but this does more than just capital. Um, <clears throat> similar to the general fund, there is debt service moved around in the water fund, so that pays for most of the capital that we discussed on Thursday, or on, uh, on Tuesday. That seemed like a long time ago. Um, for sewer, there's additional debt service because we got an interest-free loan from the MWRA, a small amount and the capital in the stormwater enterprise was previously discussed. Income report, Ms. Perry. It does seem like a lifetime ago, but <laughs> I don't know if you remember Eric explained that on October 16th, we did vote 9-0 to support this, but we put the modular classrooms to the side until the school committee had um, discussed and debated it. We then met November 6th and then voted 9-0 to support the modular um, classrooms being added to this article. Uh, what we particularly thought worked well right now is because we're in such healthy, you know, shape with the uh, free cash that the modular cl classrooms provide a great solution and reconfiguring space within a school actually adds risk and doesn't really add space. So it's not necessarily adding value. So having modular classrooms being that solution was something we supported. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Ventura. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I know we added, we voted for the modules onto this article. Um, I can't speak for everyone here, but um, as I mentioned at that first meeting, that that's essentially a Band-Aid on this, and we're going to have real expenses down the road um, if we don't address our classroom space. The population's not going down, it's, we're, and we're already out of room. So what are we looking forward to? Is there, I mean, I know we're doing $20,000 open space study at Birch Meadow and whatever that is. Um, how, how does that look at our overall school system and its capacity going into the future? I think that's something that we really need to be proactive on and um, get on that because we are going to need either a new school or fix our existing schools to handle, um, the, you know, to gain greater capacity um, to handle it. So I just want to note that the module is a great idea, but it's a, it's a temporary Band-Aid on a much bigger problem that our town's going to face and, and will be facing. Mr. Lollisher? Um, just for the benefit, in case someone's here that hadn't heard the prior discussion, I think the speaker well knows what I'm going to say. Um, this is the only solution available for next September. Um, everything else is a longer-term solution, so just to make sure people understand that. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Arena. John Arena, Precinct 1. Uh, Bob, you may have mentioned it. I, I didn't catch it. What is the last certified free cash balance? And where do you, maybe you can't tell, but where do you think we end up year end? If this um, You better sit down before I tell you, John. <laughs> um, it's, it's over $15 million. <laughs> yeah. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, so uh, I appreciate the explanation. Just if you wouldn't mind, for the, for the debt that you didn't, so that's actually not purchased, at the, I should say purchased, engaged at this point? Is that, so when, when is the expectation? And will that be an FY21 expense? Mr. Lelisher. Um, thanks, Mr. Moderator. Uh, town meeting members. We expect to borrow this winter before January 1st. That may or may not happen. That's the plan. Um, if we borrow in December, for instance, typically municipal debt has two interest payments a year and one principal payment a year. 
typically the interest payments are six months and 12 months from when you borrow and the account and the interest and the principal payment is 12 months from you borrow so if we had borrowed last may next may i.e this fiscal year we would have owed principal and two interest payments since we didn't we just will owe one interest payment so the 750,000 is principal that we didn't need to repay this year on a small amount of interest. All it is is pushing it forward, though. It was in the capital plan, though, this yes. year? Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and then the second question I had, um, if I know we haven't broached Article 17 yet, but if we um, authorize the spending, will that come out of free cash? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Business under Article 5, Ms. Engstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The intent of this article is to approve the payment of a prior year bill it has been determined that the bill was from a prior year and it was a missed monthly payment. And because it pertains to a prior year, it requires town meeting vote to approve it. Is there further discussion? Oh, actually, we need a uh, FinCom report. Sorry. Do we have a FinCom report? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting on October 16th, the Finance Committee voted to recommend this article to town meeting 9-0. Further discussion? This requires a nine-tenths vote, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try a hand count first. If it's unanimous, I will declare it as such. Otherwise, we'll take a standing count. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And we have one opposed. Uh, we have our counters. All those in favor, please. I'm sorry, was that a, was that a no vote? Okay. So, so were there any uh, no votes? No, okay, then I declared a unanimous vote. Okay. Article um, 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The intent of this article is to rescind two debt authorizations. The first is a 406... You said six? Six and oh, six. Oh, well, yeah, we're going to, uh, do we have a motion to indefinitely postpone? The um, chair of the select board moves that we indefinitely postpone article, the substance of article six. Is there a second? Second, although, is there any further discussion? None appearing, all those in favor of indefinite postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and it is indefinitely postponed. The chair of the select board moves that we indefinitely postpone the substance of Article 7. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of indefinite postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Article 8, Ms. Angstrom. Okay. So the intent of Article 8 is to rescind two debt authorizations. The first is a sewer debt authorization in the amount of $460,000. It was unneeded and can be rescinded. The second is related to the Birch Meadow Field lighting project. The authorization was a, mil a million dollars, and we spent $100,000 to design the project. However, when the bids came in, they came in much higher than expected, and the project was tabled. Recently, we decided that it would make sense to rescind this debt authorization and request a new debt authorization when the time comes that we're ready to light the four remaining fields. Income report. Mr. Brandt. Uh, so just a quick comment. Um, in November, sorry, in April, there was an instructional motion from Ms. Binda um, that triggered this review in some respect. Um, we looked at it from two angles, though. One was, what are the existing debt authorizations today that we wanted to address? Um, but within FinCom, we've also had some discussion, and I would say have general consensus that uh, we're going to look to amend our debt and capital policy to require a regular review on this point. Um, the, the general thinking here is that while Ms. Engstrom is already in the, in the habit of doing this on a regular basis, she may not be the town accountant forever, believe it or not. Uh, so we think it's probably valid to, uh, to have a piece of our debt and capital policy that requires us to review this periodically. So uh, to that point, FinCom voted on October 16th, 2019 to recommend this article 9 to 0. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Mon.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Maughan, Precinct 4. I would hope that before you come before us again with, with a request for funds for lighting, that we finish the Birch Meadow plan and that we don't authorize another million dollars when we don't have an overall plan for, for Birch Meadow. Further discussion? Yes. No. Yes, Mr. Ventura. Yeah. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. The, the lighting project for Birch Meadow goes back a few years. Um, it was actually, I served on the Little League Board of Directors for a while, and I remember being at a selectman meeting, and we were for the scoreboard at Majors Field, um, which we did. We, we decided to go solar powered, even though it was expected that that field was going to be lighted that fall. Um, literally two days in the patch. I read it was postponed indefinitely. Um, it's been a while now. Field space is at a premium um, for our kids. I know um, I've been off the board for a few years now, but they just did some major field improvements to Majors Field. They made an intermediate field um, so we can start having tournament games there. Um, I know that we have to, we, the estimates came in a lot higher at 900,000, more than 900,000, but I don't want to see this table too long. I want to see this Birch Metal project move forward. Um, you go around to some other facilities, other towns, and um, some of them are fantastic. Just let's not sit on this too long. Let's move on it. Let's get these fields in for all the kids in the town, the adults, whatever. Um, let's move forward on it uh, as soon as we can. I mean, the organizations. The people that run the organizations are all volunteers and they're, they're doing a lot for the program. Um, since my, when I was on the board, we rebuilt majors, extended it out, now they redid the skin. Um, we added the scoreboard. I mean, they're spending money hand over fist um, for this town, which are essentially gifts. Um, if you go to the fundraising events, um, it's all parents donating their time, money, energy. So let's not sit on this any longer. It's, it's years overdue. Thank you. Okay, we're discussing the rescinding the debt authorization. Is there further discussion? Mr. Berman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Bob um, or Ms. Angstrom, can you explain why we did debt authorization almost six years ago for sewer debt that we never spent? Was that for a project that we thought we were going to do but didn't do or got funding elsewhere. And if we keep these, uh, and maybe this is a FinCom question, if we keep these authorizations on the books for four, five, six, seven years, does that impinge our ability to then borrow money on things that we really need right away? So um, just looking for clarification on that. Ms. Angstrom? So as far as the authorization for the $460,000, um, that was an authorization that was a combination of capital and MWRA um, debt. So it was $350,000 of capital money from the sewer and then one ten dollars from MWRA. And then the debt portion wasn't needed, so we borrowed nothing. Um, they used all the capital money and that was enough. Okay. Um, and I guess just a follow-up question, um, maybe Mr. Burkhart could answer this. Um, is, there, um, is there a typical amount of time that we want to have authorization out there and not spend money? Is that going to be part of the FinCom policy that's going to come up? Um, Eric or Sharon, Mr. Bob, Burkhart. somebody? Uh, yes, Barry, I think generally that's part of the discussion that we'll undertake and report back to this body, okay. uh, probably in November. Great, thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion under Article 8, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 9, Mr. Clough. Oh. Ms. Angstrom. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to start by saying that I will be presenting this article on behalf of the Red Reading Retirement Board. The chairman could not make it due to a conflict tonight. But I do serve on the retirement board um, by virtue of my position as town accountant. So the article in front of you is a request to increase the COLA base for retirees from $12,000 to $14,000. 
So currently the way it works is they get 3% up to the base. And the base is $12,000. So for the, the highest amount that any retiree can get in a COLA each year is $360 a year. Increasing it to 14 would bring it up to $420, an increase of $60. The chart you see on the slide actually summarizes how each group would be impacted by this change. And I forgot to mention that this would be effective July 1st, 20, 2020, which would be the beginning of fiscal 21. So 62 of our retirees actually have pensions that are less than $12,000. And so that unfortunately they would not receive any benefit from this change. 18 of our retirees have pensions that are between 12 and 14,000, so they would receive some portion of this change depending upon how close their pension is to $14,000. And then there's 272 retirees that have pensions in excess of 14,000, so they would get the full $60 additional benefit each year. But this doesn't just affect our retirees, it also affects our active, active employees or members of the retirement system because in the future they will get higher projected pensions by $60 a year, so it compounds. And so the financial impact in fiscal 21 is an increase to the retirement assessment in the amount of $267,300. And that seems like a large number given that the change is so small, but it's the compounding. Um, it, the change to the liability is over $1.6 million because you're funding this change throughout each person's retirement for the whole retirement. Another important point to make is that the average pension here in Reading is $32,191, so pretty modest pensions. 65% of our retirees have pensions that are less than $40,000. 61% have pensions less than $35,000. So more than half have what I would consider to be pretty modest pensions. In your warrant book, there is a chart um, that actually compares all of our peer communities, and those are the communities that we've chosen, the 22 peer communities that we've chosen that are most like Reading, economically, demographically speaking. And out of the 22 communities that we consider to be most like Reading, only two are still at that original $12,000 COLA base that's been out there for 21 years. In addition, there are 104 communities here in Massachusetts, and 76% have increased this COLA base in some way. Another important point is that our Reading retirement system is scheduled to be fully funded in 2029. So, um, we are at 76.5% funded. And we've seen a lot of asset growth in our portfolio. And much of that growth came from investing member contributions. And so the board feels it's important that we share some of that asset growth with the retirees, especially since we got some of that growth from investing their money. So the Retirement Board respectfully requests that you approve this article and help us give back to the retirees who dedicated their their careers to serving Reading. Fincom report, Mr. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, at our meeting on October 9th, 2019, the Finance Committee voted 8-0 to zero to recommend this article in favor at town meeting. Uh, some of the discussion that the Finance Committee um, reached their consensus on, again, included some of what Ms. Engstrom mentioned here today, looking at communities. 76% um, again have already increased that uh, off of the original base established uh, in 1998, including 20 of our 22 peer community, communities, many of which um, have not achieved the same level of, pension, of funding their, against their pension liability to date that Reading has. And it should be noted that, again, we remain committed to fully funding that liability by 2029. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the back, Mr. Grant. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, Precinct 4. I just have a, a couple of questions. Did, um, thank you for this additional information. I appreciate that. Did you look at um, the funding status? Because it looks like the last date we have is the beginning of 2017, which is 
almost three years ago now. So do we have an the updated? Funding status for <laughs> other retirement boards or ours? Sorry. For, for Reading. So it shows we're 73.8% funded as of January 1st, 2017. So the up. number I just gave, the 76.5% funded, is as of January 1st, 2019, which is our most recent valuation. 76.5? 76.5%. Okay. And have you looked at how that funding status would change with this proposed change? So the pension liability would go up, right? It would go up, yes. So the funding status would go down then, right? Yeah, I would imagine, but they didn't give us the number. The actuary did not give us a number. Do, do you have a sense of order of magnitude or no? Oh, yes. It wouldn't actually um, go down because our assessment is being increased to cover um, the extra cost. I'm sorry, the assessment is being increased? The assessment. So there's an assessment that gets charged to the town every year to fund the pension. And so this change would increase the assessment in fiscal 21, so there would be no change. Okay, so the, the pension liability would go up, but then the amount paid would go up at the same time, so that mm -hmm. the actual funded level wouldn't change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just on the pension funding level, so I was looking at some historical data. It seems like we've been in that sort of mid-70% funded level for a very long time, like we first hit that in the early 2000s. Is, I'm just sort of curious to understand why that hasn't, one would expect it to sort of slightly increase year over year, but it hasn't really changed that much for a while. And I'm just curious to, if there's any reason why that might be happening, because I'm, I'm concerned looking at increasing our pension liability where the funding status hasn't actually changed that much over the years. A lot of these funds are invested in the stock market, and in 2008, I believe, we saw some serious declines, which really hurt our funding status, and then we've been building back up since. Right. Um, so actually on that a similar point about returns, so our return assumption is 7.65%, which is the highest return assumption on here, or tied for the highest. Um, and I was looking at some other data that showed more than half of funds are at 7.5% or below. And I have two questions around that. Do we think that 7.65% is still realistic, especially looking at the past five years where it's been in sort of the 6% range? And then have we considered, if we were to change our investment retirement assumption lower, how that would affect our funding status? Because that would increase the size of the liability. Mm -hmm. So we did, um, on the most recent actual evaluation, decrease our assumption for the investment return from 7.65 to 7.5, and that always increases your liability, and it did in that case as well. But we are still scheduled to be fully funded by 2029, which is nine years from now, so we're still on track. All right. And then just the last question was, um, do you have a sense for why they chose 14,000 as opposed to 13,000? They're allowed to increase by increments of 1,000, and they just thought, you know, make the progress with just $2,000 to start off. I mean, I would imagine this is something we'll have to revisit years from now, do a little at a time. Um, and also looking at our peers, a lot of them are doing about 2,000 to start that increase. So looking at the, the peer communities, there's a number that are at 13,000. Mm -hmm. And so basically there's, there's only two that are at 12. Andover is only 50% funded, so they have their own problem. Shrewsbury is 92, so that's a no-brainer. For the rest of them, there's four that are more well-funded than we are, and four that are less well-funded than we are, and the four less well-funded than we are at 13,000. And those also have the 7.5% or lower. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me a more reasonable number would be the 13,000 as our first step instead of 14,000. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. It's all right. I think we should do 13,000 instead of 14,000. <laughs> you think it should be 13 so, instead of 14? Yeah, so was that debated at all, 13 versus 14, or was it just sort of? There was discussion, but the board decided that, that 14 would make more sense, because we had gone so long. We were so focused on getting the funding percentage up that we weren't really entertaining this conversation at all for a number of years. And then four years ago, we were going to bring this to town meeting, and then the need for the override um, came, and we felt the timing was off and, and not necessary to ask at the time. And so not enough discussion had happened over the years on this COLA base increase because we were so focused on getting funded higher funding percentages and not really focused on it. And then now we're looking at it saying we should be focused on it because these returns that we're getting, our investment returns, some of this money is the members 
contributions and we're earning money on it and we're not giving them any increase in their COLA. I think the, the point of my questions was more, I, I certainly understand that the pensioners have been contributing, it was more should we be taking this step given our current funding level and given the, um, the returns over the past five years? But it, I think that's been fairly satisfied, so thank you. Further discussion? Oh, yes, Ms. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Elaine Webb, Precinct One. Can you go back one slide? I just want to make sure that I truly understand this. So for the retirees that have um, excess of 14,000, and you said the average, I think, was 32,000 a year, mm -hmm. the COLA they get is still just on that 14, so it's the 420, which is $60 per year per retiree. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> I think this is a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. I'm mean, highly in favor of this. 12,000 COLA, really lagging. We should be more of a leader. I'm strongly in favor of this. Prove this. Our retirees deserve it. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. I also think it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I hate us being at the bottom of the pack when it comes to things like taking care of people who help support and build the town. Um, so I'm going to support it. Um, but I do have a question. Um, who manages um, basically our pension fund? Is it done um, sort of locally? Are we part of a statewide group? And can you tell us um, high level sort of how Reading's returns have compared to our peers and then maybe also a statewide average? Ms. Angstrom. Yep. Mr. Lillichar. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the pension is invested in the state's PRIT, so this, the returns that Reading receives is identical to the state and to most other pension funds that do it that way. Um, some pension funds, fewer and fewer every year, do it themselves and have their own magic formula. Um, so far, Reading does not do that and has not for a long time. Okay. So th we've exactly matched the average return is, is the answer. So, when we, so basically, when we had estimate of 7.65% return, when everyone else had 7.5%, is that because, you know, we were slow to react or um, that's been what the statewide average has been or? I, that's a hard question to answer, um, but I'd say that um, when Sharon came to me, I pushed for lower. That used to be my business, but it is just math. It's just right. numbers. It's not real. Right. Um, we looked at seven and a quarter, and <laughs> it's not cash. Let me put it that way. <laughs> the difference between seven and a half and seven and a quarter, seven and a quarter sounds more conservative to the previous speaker, and in order to fund it in 2029, the school and the town budgets would have taken an amazing hit. So it didn't make sense to interrupt the operations for what is just accounting, if you will. Okay. Um, so the seven five is more realistic. Um, again, it's just an assumption. It just puts numbers out there. It doesn't right. do any funding. Right. So the big, so the bigger the return, that means the quicker that we're going to get to fund our obligation. And then the the worse return, it's going to take us longer to fund that. Correct, and 2029 is the target based on that number. We know that number won't be right. It'll right. be higher or lower, okay. so it'll be shorter or longer. Um, but it was really surprising to me when I looked at the numbers at how sharply the pension uh, assessment will drop once full funding happens. It's something on the order of, now it'll be a higher number by then. It's gonna drop six or seven million dollars a year. Wow. So that'll allow, as has been discussed by FinCom for years, um, a formal policy on funding OPEP. Right. and probably still having some extra money to use. Great. Thank you. Where are the discussion? Yes. Eileen Leterio, Precinct 8. As a retired uh, teacher, educator in the Reading School System, I am most certainly in favor of passing and increasing the COLA to $60 more a year in my pension fund. And I would also like to thank in advance all those who are willing to vote yes on this uh, particular <laughs> article. <laughs> thank you. Further discussion? Was 
Lose their hand? No? Okay, we're ready for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 10, Ms. Delios. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Article 10 is um, an article that is seeking authorization from town meeting for procurement of an affordable housing monitoring agent for an extended contract term, specifically for one development, Redding Woods. This article does not impact any of the other developments. Thank you, Sharon. So this is an article that um, comes about from an unusual situation. Um, the affordable housing monitoring agent that was hired by the developer for Reading Woods had an untimely passing last spring. And with her death, um, the town found themselves in a very um, awkward position of having to work collaboratively with the state, since this is a 40-R district, um, on how we were going to handle the need for a successor as an affordable housing monitoring agent. And uh, we were told by the state that this has actually never come up. And so once again, Reading finds themselves in uh, uh, kind of at the forefront. And so, we then went through a procurement process, hired a successor, LDS consultants. But because of the um, Mass General Law Chapter 30B, the Uniform Procurement Act, we are uh, restricted to a three-year maximum contract term. Um, it, it was very difficult to procure the services of another affordable housing monitoring agent. And again, it is unique because now the town was hiring the monitoring agent. As I stated, the developer on all these developments does the hiring of the monitoring agent. So this has never come up before. The other point I would want to make is that um, this article is asking for authorization for the town manager to extend the contract, but it also will require going back to the select board for their approval. Thank you. Income report, Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Karen Herrick, um, FinCom voted on October 16th, um, 9 0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Yeah, Ms. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. Okay, I'm missing something. So why, I understand someone died and that's awful, but if the person was hired by Pulte, why isn't Pulte replacing this? Um, I, and also, the is, is this a proposal, a corporation that you're hiring, or, and that we'd be offering a contract to basically a company to provide the services, or are we hiring a particular person for longer than three years on a contract? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, th those are all really good questions. We ask the same thing. Why is the town in this position? And uh, as I mentioned, this had never come up before. So Pulte Homes is no longer involved in this Redding Woods. All of the units have been sold. And so I had suggested to the official at the state that we should go through Pulte Homes. And um, I did not get a response to that. Um, so the only alternative we had was to be proactive and hire the monitoring agent by the town. And just so you know, the monitoring agent is paid from the closing costs of the resales. So there's no, um, that, that's how the monitoring agent gets paid. This is mostly what they handle is mostly resale of the condominiums, the affordables. Okay, I was gonna ask what is it that they do? They, they handle the resale to assure that we're keeping the right yes. percentage of low yes. income? There's a laundry list of other things they do, but that's mainly what they do. Further discussion, Mr. Arena?
John Arena, Precinct 1. Gene, a few questions. Um, I'm surprised it isn't a conflict of interest to have the developer hire that agent. They're not necessarily going to work in the town's interests. I understand they have a funding source to resell, but isn't that a conflict? Um, no. What, what, um, the way the process works is the developer hires and pays for the monitoring agent up front. And the monitoring agent is approved by the select board. So the town has the ability to say yes or no, but the town is not paying for it. This is mostly a front-loaded expense that the developer is paying for to engage this monitoring agent initially to do all those sales. So if I understand you, that funding remains available despite the untimely demise of that individual. Is there any No, that funding has already been dispersed. Um, the only funding that really is engaged here is that it, when they re go through a resale at the closing, there's a small fee that the monitoring agent gets. And that, those fees today are not available to the town. They're being collected and I guess retained by the developers. Is that correct? It's, it's part of the closing on the new unit. And those, fun those funds flow to who now in the absence of this agent? Who do those funds flow to? They've already been uh, allocated and spent. On the resales, on, sub on future resales, where do they go? The future resale contemplates the expense of the monitoring agent as part of the closing costs. I'm not getting that. But, um, would, would a contract let by the town anticipate the inclusion of termination for cause or termination for convenience language? There is a termination clause, yes. Is it both for convenience as well as cause? Um, I can look it up. It's, I'm just curious. Would it would more likely? It's our standard contract. Okay. And is there a review period that you anticipate an either annually or, or biannually for performance, for example, or no, that's typically not the case? That's not the case. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Gene, don't we already have a monitoring agent that we share with, uh, I think, was it Linfield or North Reading? Um, why can't we just use that person to sort of fill that role? It's already somebody that we're paying for, um, and they have the expertise. Uh, isn't it their job to kind of maintain the affordable units we have and then also go out and um, recruit income eligible people for the new affordable units? So what you're referring to is the Metro North Regional Housing yes. Services yes. Office. Okay. And we do have a full-time staff person who is, um, assists several towns. It's the town of Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Saugus. Okay. So we have 25% of a, of a virtually full-time person um, who really is doing other things than what this specific monitoring agent is doing. This monitoring agent is going through elaborate calculations every time there's a resale, is following um, close protocol with the state, several inquiries, and I only know this because in the time frame between when we didn't have a monitoring agent and when we did, staff was involved in this as I was. Um, it's a very complicated portion of affordable housing. It requires highly specialized knowledge, and we're not paying for this. It's coming out okay. of the resale of the unit. So it, it's, it's, I think it's a, a very important component of this. We're on the hook for it through various legal documents, and I think it would be um, extremely important to c continue with these services. We have a signed contract already in place with LDS, which is a uh, consulting company. They, um, they are doing this for a very small fee for, for each resale. So I think it is an important service. Uh, what we're asking for tonight is the ability to go beyond the three-year term, because what will happen if town meeting does not agree with this and votes it down is we'll have to go through another procurement process, which is, again, going to be staff time and, um, and more expense to the town to go out and procure again for a service that somebody's already been vetted for. If you think about how hard it is to create the affordable units to get out to our 10%, um, maintaining them is probably even more important. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think that this is the best way to do it, cost effective, I know we've lost units that were affordable because we, you know, no one could find the documents. And I would hate to see us work so hard to create these units only to 
sort of have them go back on the market for market because we no one you know paid attention to the deed restrictions yep. so if, the, if this is the best way to do it i encourage folks to vote for this thank, thank you. you further discussion and appearing are we, are we ready for the vote all those in favor please raise your hand those opposed and the motion carries business under article 11 mr the lesher Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Rubbish is confusing to me, so I want to start out by explaining the two parts of rubbish um, and the fact that this article is just one of the parts. If you look at page 12 and you look at the second paragraph, and I'm just going to read a little of it, it starts for additional background. That was meant for exactly what it says. That's part two of rubbish that we're not discussing tonight. That is JRM that does the uh, hauling and recycling that we all see. This article in front of you is asking for an extension beyond three years, similar to the last article on uh, rubbish disposal, and that's something none of us see. And right now there's a monopoly in that business, which is not very favorable to the town. It's Covanta. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that the four additional background was giving town meeting a little bit more that has nothing specifically to do with this. But the fact that this body did allow a 10-year uh, contract, actually longer than that last time, has been extremely fortunate for us because both aspects of the rubbish business are in upheaval. There's been bankruptcies. There's been vendors walking away from contracts in municipalities as close as Stoneham, costing them several hundred thousand dollars a year, never mind litigation. So it was very fortunate and very well timed that town meeting had allowed us to negotiate um, with JRM and sign a long-term deal. The current market for disposal is, is also in chaos, but it's less chaos because it's a monopoly. So we know what the price is. Um, I can't say for sure that the town will sign a 10-year or a longer than three-year contract today, but I can tell you that having that as a negotiating tool is helpful. Um, and we have to make a decision by next June, and we are working with other communities to deal with this. Um, this is the first time in my experience that we have run into a monopoly. Um, the price that they're offering, at least the good part is, they're offering the same price to existing clients and us and all the towns working with us, so there's no favoritism going on. Um, but it would be helpful to have this tool, whether we use it in the next six months or after that, I can't say for sure. Um, but just as, as happened with the hauling and recycling for JRM, um, that was a tool to be used. And when you need to use it, you can't always plan to have a town meeting article. Pincom report, Mr. Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting on October 16th, the Finance Committee <laughs> voted to recommend this article to town meeting by a vote of nine to zero. We're okay with granting uh, this uh, additional authority, particularly with the potential advantage of having a financial benefit to the town, uh, particularly when the town manager has achieved this with similar authority in the past. Thank you. For the discussion, Mr. Herrick. Uh, Steve Herrick, uh, Precinct 8. Uh, Bob, we've come across this uh, three-year uh, contract business a number of times, two articles in a row, in fact, here. Um, and I've, we've seen this come up at town meeting before. Um, could you just give us a quick primer on exactly what, what's the original thinking around this three years that's written into, I assume this is in our bylaws someplace? It's, it's state law. law. A state law. Okay, thank you. It's uh, state law to make four-year contracts very inexpensive and three years very expensive because that's the practical impact. Ah, fascinating. <laughs> so, will passing this article, uh, it doesn't seem, that doesn't, the way it's written here does not appear to be a, um, uh, a one-time thing. Are we making this uh, for all and forever? We can, you and any future town manager has the ability to enter into 30-year um, contracts. Or can we, is this going to have to be, is this just a one-shot deal? Is this only good until the, for the next hiring round? Yeah, that's a good question. I think this one is in perpetuity, the way it's written, which I don't particularly care or need. Um, I don't mind if it's amended to have some time horizon, but it's written forever. Um, and, and just to be clear, 
many towns don't come to town meeting or their legislative body to ask this permission. They live with the three years and they pay whatever it costs. We come sparingly. We did come, I think, last April for um, school technology, backup technology, both for the town and the schools. So you're right. We probably, on average, in the last 10 years have appeared maybe once a year, maybe once every other year. But it's only when it's the economics are really volatile or really favorable. In this case, it's volatile. OK. Um, OK, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Further discussion? Mr. Lippitt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Lippitt, Precinct 7. Just a clarification, Bob. The bottom line here says it expires June 2020. You're talking about renegotiating it now. But up above, it says in 2015, we signed a 10-year contract. And in the warrant, it says it expires in June of 2026. I'm confused. You're, you're getting into the dilemma I introduced with two parts of rubbish. Collection is signed for a 10-year. And that was done uh, years ago and allowed by April 2015 town meeting. That's that little paragraph for additional information. So that, that is one fact. It's perhaps not entirely relevant, but it's an example. Um, the current disposal contract, which is the subject of this article, does expire next June. Okay, so there are two contracts yes. you're talking about here. Thank Correct. you. Correct. Further discussion? Mr. Simmons? Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. <laughs> this year, j and uh, we've, we've, <clears throat> we've added another uh, uh, leaf pickup. Is that part of the contract? Did they charge extra? How did they do that? Um, that's part of the rubbish collection contract. And that's our DPW director's negotiating skills as to what we can squeeze out of them. Good show. So, you know, collect, collecting leaves is just better for, for, from our perspective, better in so many ways. But obviously, it's an additional expense for the vendor. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mullen, Precinct 4. D just a question. Our current disposal contract is what we're talking about renewing. You said it's a monopoly. I, I think you told us. But can you repeat who that company is and what the ultimate fate of our rubbish is? <laughs> well, I can answer the first part. I'm not sure I can answer the second. It's Covanta. Um, and the problem is there's so few areas in the state to dispose of rubbish. Um, we've looked at alternatives such as a vendor that would drive it out of state, in some cases quite some distance, and it's just cost prohibitive. So when I say mon monopoly, I mean realistically within this, the geography we are, there's, there's a monopoly. But there are other alternatives, but they're not cost effective to send our trash to Rhode Island. I think one was up in New Hampshire. So it goes to a landfill? Um, I think it goes to an incinerator, incinerator Jane. Yeah, it's burned. It is the one in Saugus or Lynn? Yeah, yep. Resco, or I think is the name. That's so. Close. So it does go to that facility. Correct. Relatively local, and it is converted in theory to energy. Correct. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Snyder. Gina Snyder, Precinct Five. Um, Kavanta is in Haverhill. And it's a waste to energy facility. So they are generating energy by burning the waste. Um, Willibrator, I believe, is in Saugus. So okay. I would assume that's another option that's within driving distance. Jane, it looks like you're going to have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Goes to Wahibo. Willibrator will not take any more tonnage. They're not allowed. They're at maximum. So we had two alternatives, Covanta and Willibrator, are out of state. And so we're at Covanta. OK. Um, I'm a, I, I totally trust what um, Bob and the select board will do, but I am a little concerned about having it not have a deadline that one of the other speakers brought up. But I, I don't really know how you would amend it to say just this one time or something. Is Mr. Lasher. 
um, I'd have to get the motion out to give you exact words, but conceptually, um, I think it would be fine to put in a date that's four or five years from now. That would allow us to do some kind of a short-term contract while the market is not healthy, and then perhaps have a much better opportunity within a few years and not a long time frame to do a better long-term contract. So I'll get the motions up here. Can I leave that to you? There's one suggestion that would be five years. Oops. If I could spell. <laughs> is that acceptable to the, um, Ms. Snyder? Okay, is there a second to that proposed amendment? Okay, we're now talking about the proposed amendment. Is there further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Ben Reem, and I'm from Precinct 7. We're talking about different places and different as, like, those are our only options for managing rubbish. Um, when I think back to the last... Are you, are you discussing the proposed amendment? Oh, yeah. Um, if not, I'll call you when we vote on that. <laughs> I just remember a time or I spoke with people when there was a time when, when rubbish was, uh, was curtailed to two bins and unlimited recycling. And that seems to have sort of fallen by the wayside. And now people can have like six or seven or eight huge 40 gallon bins of trash, which then have to get picked up by JRM. When in fact, if we could just go back to what we had and, and recycle more, we would have a lot more flexibility. Okay, we're discussing the proposed amendment, Mr. Elijah. I don't think it's germane, but that is absolutely factually not true, everything you just said. There is a mandatory recycling and there is a barrel limit that that is enforced. And believe me, I get the calls when it's enforced. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Mr. Sasso? John Sasso, Precinct 2. Sorry, it's getting late. Just. Um, Prior to July 1st, 2025, so is that, so that's for when you can use this or up through the contract itself? Mr. Lasher. Uh, my understanding would be that um, between now and July 1st, 2025, we could sign a longer than three year contract. But once July 1st, 2025 passes, we have to go back to the three year. Okay, all right, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? All right, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries, and we are back to the main, men, main motion as amended. Any further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Uh, we. We have a motion to adjourn. It's 10.07. We've got two articles left, but uh, I will take the vote. All those in favor of um, adjournment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Business under Article 12. Um, Mr. Lalasha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> I hope that any new town meeting members have read the background, because I really don't intend to cover the whole background. Um, but three years ago, in a, actually in a special town meeting in September, um, this body approved what is really pioneering work in the state um, as part of several steps to help, um, if you will, our, our elderly age in place. Through three years,
through three years of experience, um, we collectively, the, the board, myself, the assessor, and the, and the board of assessors have learned some things. Um, <clears throat> when we drafted the home rule petition initially, um, somewhere down uh, during the process, we were told by the state, specifically by DOR, that we'd be limited to a three year. There's that three year again. We didn't know that when we first started out. Um, uh, but the DOR was very clear that this is something the town meeting would have to come back and reapprove every three years unless state legislation passed to make it a local option or even to make it mandatory. Our assessor has certainly had a lot of discussions within his industry and lobbied on Beacon Hill to make it a local option, but as yet there's been uh, no solution there. So this article specifically is to renew the senior tax relief put in place three years ago with a slight change. Just to go through uh, some of the statistics, on average, 180-ish uh, seniors have had a tax benefit um, over the three years individually. Uh, that column that says factor was the thing we want to change. Um, the select board had an option. Again, this was a new project program. We really didn't know what the math would work out to be. We really only had rough guesses. So the select board had the room to change um, within a band of 0 0.5 times the senior, uh, I'm sorry, the circuit breaker uh, on the state level to two times. So more or less the state circuit breaker for anyone that files form CB is about $1,000, it's a little higher. So in theory, depending on how this worked, the board could have chosen half of that or $500 or double $2,000. Um, as you can see from the history in the first year, the board tried, uh, selected double and then in the last two years have selected one and a half times. One of the consequences of selecting double, it didn't affect a lot of people, but it did affect a handful, is um, some of the seniors that got that much tax relief were not even eligible the next year to file Form CB, so they lost their state income tax benefit as well as their local real estate benefit. Um, a factor of one and a half seems to have cured that. So the change that um, the board, select board has requested and agreed to is to fix that factor at one and a half times and not allow a choice every year. In case anyone's new, um, the applicant has to have filed and received a prior year schedule CB at the state level. That's the first requirement. The applicant has owned property in Reading and it doesn't have to be where they currently live for at least the prior 10 consecutive years. So this was not meant to attract other people to move into town in order to get this benefit. It was to um, attract residents and retain residents who are already here. And then annually, the applicant must apply to the Board of Assessors every year. They can't just leave the application on file, as it were. Um, it has to be done every year. We looked at many other options with different twists and different math. And this is by far the simplest version that we all agreed worked very well. Um, this was passed before an override passed, so we absolutely were not looking to add any kind of extra staffing or even hours. We had to make it simple so that the current assessing staff and the board could do it. Um, and it's been very successful. This is one of the things I'm most proud about as an accomplishment for this town. Um, we've really put ourselves on the map and many, many other towns are looking at Reading. I don't want to say too much about one of them because we share their assessor, but they uh, have tried to pass this for quite some time and have the blueprint in, in addition to the experience we have, and it's still hung up on Beacon Hill. So I give a lot of uh, credit to the select board for passing this before there was an override for the, for the assessors are coming up with it, but also our Beacon Hill delegation for moving this forward. It's been a very important thing. Maybe it's only 180 people, but, but much like that pension $30, it's the 180 people who needed it the most. Uh, FinCom report. Mr. Bur Thanks, Mr. Moderator. On our October 16th financial uh, uh, FinCom meeting, we voted 9-0 in support of this article, um, similar to what um, Bob just uh, went through in our discussion. We learned more about the program um, and its be benefits um, for our seniors to age in place. Um, the essence of this um, uh, change was a modest fix um, you know, to correct um, the taxpayer el eligibility. By law committee report, Mr. Struble. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our uh, October 23rd uh, meeting, the bylaw committee voted 5-0 to recommend the content of this article to town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Grant. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, Precinct 4. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lasher, for your comments characterizing uh, this uh, article as it's been put into place. Uh, I do have a philosophical argument with it, and I just I want to re reiterate it for people in the room. I actually tried to articulate it three years ago. And the, actually, I guess first I want to make sure I understand. So the, the taxes, the tax benefit that's given to the seniors is picked up by other residential taxpayers, not the commercial base, right? Mr. Lasher. Um, under state law, that part of your statement is correct. But then when the tax rate is set by the select board, they have split the rate so that actually currently the commercial sector overshares their portion. Okay. So anyway, the thinking is that when we give this benefit to low-income seniors, it does actually impact the rest of the town. And when you think about the rest of the town, it is more economically diverse than we might always think. So when this was actually originally proposed in 2016, I was out of a job, and my wife does not work, and I was out of a job for 15 months. So the concept of me paying more in my taxes as a low-income person at that time to other low-income people in town, to me that was philosophically difficult to get by. There are younger families in town, people who live paycheck to paycheck, but are not seniors and don't have the chance to have the circuit breaker credit like the seniors <coughs> have. So fundamentally, shifting taxes from people who may be low income already in town to other low income people just to let them age in place seems then to make it harder for those lower income families to stay here. So we're perhaps favoring one group over another. And so where you can see that acting out, I think a little bit is on page 15 with the table that has the CD benefit and then some examples. So this is in the context of the 2016 preparation for the future override. So the 125% tax relief at an $856 average, that'd be $1,000 in addition to the 856, right? That's a thousand dollars is an addition, right? That's not the combined. No, the one is an income tax benefit from the state. Yeah. The property tax is whatever level times that number or multiplied by that number. So the property tax is the one thousand seventy. Correct. For this example. Um, no, the one thousand seventy is the maximum um, tax relief they can have from the state on income tax, and then depending on the factor. If a factor of one was adopted, that would also be the maximum real estate tax they could benefit. If the factor was two, then it could be double that, $2,140. Oh, I see. So that's that table down below, that 2000 Would yep. that be two times? But OK. All right. And so then if you think about the, so the 2016 override, um, so that one didn't go through. But the one that did go through increased property taxes on average by about $500 per person. But the increase here is $2,000. So framing this in the context of to help our seniors stay in place when we do a property tax override is a little bit disingenuous. And in fact, I'd say it's a little bit generous. So I'd like to make an amendment. Instead of having 150%, have it 125% as a more reasonable and fair percentage, or factor, I should say. Is there a second to that motion? Second, OK. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? So I just, oh, go ahead, continue. if I could just ask one sure. quick clarifying question, which might help. Yep. In the paragraph below, it says, a percentage lower than 150% was considered simply not enough financial assistance. So if there is any sort of measure or discussion around that, I'd be curious to know. But at the end of the day, I still think this is an example of fairness where we could be more fair with all members of our community. Mr. Malasher. Another factor here, it's not fair, it's economics. 
uh, an elderly couple in their house doesn't have school children that this fellow has to educate. It's called enlightened self-interest. So the, the brutal truth of economics are we want to encourage these people for lots of reasons. One of them is financial reasons to remain in their house. And, and that was very much discussed at the beginning of this. And to the credit of the board at the time, they did not tie passage of this to the override. It was discussed at the same time as the first override effort, but it was not linked. We'll only give this out if the override uh, succeeded. So just to be clear, those are two separate thoughts. Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Mario. Bill Brown, Precinct 8, and one of the 180. Thank you. Um, to the gentleman's point and Bob's point, indeed, I live on a very large lot of land, a very desirable part of Reading. You can let me stay there and give me $1,000, uh, or I can sell it, and you can put three ch children in the school system at $13,000 apiece, $39,000. You make your choice. We have a discussion on the proposed amendment. Mr. Arena. John Arena, Precinct 1. I just wanted to respond to Mr. Grant's well-thought and well-considered response. Um, both uh, Mr. Lalasher and Mr. Brown hit it on the head. This was really about trying to keep seniors in place. We realized at the time that um, every household that was vacated likely would be a candidate for or a shoe-in for either a 40B or a multi-unit um, housing project. And in an effort to stem that further increase in potential school populations, the thought was that this was in the self-interest in the town in a much longer and much harder way to measure. But clearly, as Mr. Brown said, you consider the, con the consequence of, of um, this approach versus the impact of two or three or four families living with school-age kids, and it's, it's fairly easy math, but it's hard to demonstrate where it's going. But in, in the macro sense, it was easy for us to, to rationalize this, and that was really the primary motivation. It wasn't as an offset necessarily for the override, although some framed it in that context. It really was around trying to keep seniors particularly those that were vi vibrant but maybe had fixed incomes, to stay in place and remain a part of the fabric of the community. <coughs> Further discussion? Yes. Ms. Landry. Ann Landry, Precinct 5, and a Select Board member. Um, I just wanted to say, Tom, I really empathize with uh, where you're coming from, and I've engaged in conversation in the last couple of months with both Victor, our assessor, and Bob Lillisher, our town manager, uh, to understand um, what options there are for tax relief for uh, low-income residents. And I've come to learn that, um, to learn that it would require a, uh, a home rule petition to do something in that space, even if we wanted to do something um, that that looks sep that, that is separate from the home rule petition that we're proposing now. But if we were to expand, for example, uh, the volunteer-based uh, senior t uh, senior tax relief that is like a tax work-off program, if we wanted to make that available to residents who are interested in um, who, who are interested in volunteering their services to the town in exchange for tax relief because they're going through a period of unemployment or some other financial difficulty, that would also require a home rule petition. Um, and my understanding is that there are not, uh, not currently sufficient volunteer opportunities uh, for tax relief for the senior citizens who are interested in pursuing that now. Um, in terms of support for struggling families in town who are not senior citizens, I understand from Bob that that is primarily now handled handled through health and um, health and human and excuse me human and elder services. Um, but I would be happy, uh, Tom, to talk offline too if we want to kind of brainstorm ways that we can uh, support struggling families who are not senior citizens in our community. Further discussion. Yes, in the back. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Eric Affin, Precinct 4. Um, first of all, I support any effort to help uh, you know, aging in place, uh, anybody in our town that needs assistance. Um, but to Tom's point, um, I have a quick, quick
question on the logistics of the senior tax relief. Is there any way within the context of the senior tax relief to carve out folks who are low income to be exempt if their property taxes are increased because of this? Is there any way to set a threshold so that those folks are not affected by this? Mr. Lillisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm not sure that I've understood your question, so I may ask, have to ask you to repeat it, but sure. the, qual the qualifications financially that we use are identical to what the state uses to qualify for Schedule CB. So there are income limits on that, and there's asset value of your house limits. We didn't create any additional uh, tests, if you will, for income or assets. So I was just thinking about the example that Tom gave or other mm -hmm. folks who are low income who might be, might be adversely affected by the senior tax relief, their property taxes going up and adding a burden. So you're saying that it would, ha it, it would have to fall within state limits uh, and state regulations? Uh, now I understand that you were kind of answering, asking me the other half, yeah. uh, who pays. <laughs> Um, I don't have the exact number in front of me. It was approximately $30 a household that this cost. Um, and there is no way to draw a line as to who should and shouldn't pay that, other than through tax classification in which the board has decided to shift, I can't remember, a, a good percent of this to the commercial sector. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Friedman, did you have a question? Mr. Grant, um, point well taken. Andy Friedman, sorry, um, Precinct 4. Uh, my understanding when I voted for this 1.5 split is that the split was covered, um, I'm sorry, the, the 158 uh, or tax relief was fully covered by the split tax rate that we voted for. Um, if that's not the case, the town manager can correct me. Further discussion? Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. I was a member of the board that originally voted for this when it first came up. And um, I just want to reiterate what Bob said. I think, Bob, you might have said that was one of your proudest moments of being a town manager and that we were able to do something that nobody in the common, actually, I take that back, two other towns, richer towns than Reading, had figured out. And we were really going to be leaders on, on this. And, um, I was really proud of that vote. Um, but I wanted to say that one of the reasons that I supported it was not defensive. It wasn't that I was afraid someone like Mr. Brown was going to sell his house and then someone was going to buy it and then we'd have three more kids to educate. That is something that never entered my mind. What entered my mind, and I hope what um, enters yours, is that it's just the right thing to do. People who moved to this town 40 or 50 years ago that made Reading what it is today to the point where now all of us felt proud that we wanted to move in there, we should do everything that we can in our power um, to make it easier for them to stay. I talked to so many people that said, I can't afford to live in this town anymore, and as, and as much as I want to, I can't afford it, and that's because property values are rising, which is great, but people can't live on the equity of their houses until they sell them. And in most cases, with a lot of the seniors, that equity is going to go to their heirs. So um, I certainly sympathize um, with, the, um, with the sentiments um, my friend Tom Grant brought up, because there's lots of other people that are struggling. We just don't have the mechanism right now um, to do that. And, and, and Ms. Landry, thank you for, for you know, bringing that up. And I hope that there's other ways that we can kind of figure that out. But just because we haven't figured that out, it doesn't mean that we should take away the little bit of money that we're giving to the seniors um, who, like I said, built this town. So I'm not in support of the amendment. I think that we, we, um, it was a little hit and miss in the beginning, but we, fi we figured out that 1.5 gets the maximum amount of benefit to the most amount of people. So I think that we should keep that and really feel proud of ourselves for doing that. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. So again, I think we all are empathetic to Mr. Grant's uh, comments. Uh, and doing good sometimes doesn't mean you, know, you don't have other issues that still need attention. I think the other difference here is the seniors typically in these situations have not only contributed over a long period of time to the benefit of the town through taxes, but 
most always have very limited options, right? They're not likely to get another job if they even wanted to or are physically able to. So, uh, you know, their, their condition is limited by that respect. Thank you. Yes. Um. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Doxer, Precinct 1, member of the Select Board. Um, just one of our Sure Town meeting, we did look at uh, different rates and, and different factors, one and a quarter, one and a half, two, different things like that. And we all kind of came to the conclusion, I believe, but I'll speak for myself, that this worked for the most people. It made sense. The total shift is on the order of about $260,000. So across the town, average taxpayer who is not eligible for this is paying an increased amount order of magnitude probably around thirty dollars so we also looked at it as you know what is the the impact on the average taxpayer for doing this really what we deem to be a very good thing thank you Ms. Alvarado oh, okay Mr. Halsey John Halsey precinct one um, in response to the commercial split, the offset, um, there is a fact that um, this can only be shifted to residential properties. Realizing that there was an equity issue, um, the Board of Selectmen, um, at, the f at the very first year that we recognized that this was present, equalized that with a very small split. Um, that split has since been increased by tenfold, actually, um, even though the split is still small. Um, the split was actually out to the third decimal place in order to offset, in order to bring the commercial tax bill up in an amount equal to the $30 that the residents were paying so that that balanced itself out. That's the way it was done originally. Um, and since that time has passed, there's been two consecutive um, splits that have been substantially higher than that. So one could argue that more of the cost is being absorbed by the commercial property at this time. Furthermore, you know, as having been one of the people very involved at the beginning of this discussion, um, it was put in front of you three and a half years ago so that we could use, utilize it for three years. The planning for that dates back four or five years as we worked with the assessor on trying to understand what we could do for a targeted group. And although um, Mr. Grant brings up a point that we may have another group that needs attention, I think these are mutually exclusive one from the other. Um, what we're able to do here is help roughly 180 people, and we're able to do that in a fairly substantial way, in a measured way. Um, We've found a certain way down the road that the state seems to think is probably the smartest thing that was done, but they're having a hard time getting out of their own way. I know that'll be shocking to many of you in this room uh, that they can't get it done. But, um, I mean, the reality is all that's really in front of you here is a renewal of something that you decided on three years ago. Um, and with a small adjustment that fix fixes the percentage paid um, because what we've discovered through trial and error, which is sometimes what you have to do when you're breaking ground, we've discovered that we can do the most for the most people by setting it about at 150. Uh, the idea of adjusting that, and this is speaking to the amendment, I think is actually not a real, it's not a good idea. Um, I do think that there are certain things that have been brought up tonight. The concept of this senior tax relief was th there was a, a downstream benefit, if you will. Um, it happened to come at a time pretty coincidental to when there was an override passed, and I think that was very helpful to seniors, although that wasn't the design. Secondly, um, you know, Mr. Brown brings up an interesting point. Um, although it was never designed to defensively protect um, the cost of more children in town. The facts are, when seniors who have spent a long time here stay, um, 
They have a certain, um, they've made contributions to this town because if you look, this thing has residency requirements and ownership requirements. So a senior doesn't move to town this year and get benefit of this. This is for the designed around the seniors who have committed to this town for a very long period of time. And I think that we need to just move on with this, renew the good work that we did, understand there's a small amendment to it that uh, accounts for the greater good. Um, and I would urge you to reject this amendment and move forward with the proposal as it's been presented. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge. Kevin Leet, uh, number one, uh, can we move forward with closing debate on the question, on the amendment? You'd like to move to end debate yes. on the amendment or the whole? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one and then the other? Okay. Is there, a, is there a second? There's a motion to end debate on this article, including the, uh, the motion. Okay. All those in, oh, this requires two-thirds vote. I'm sorry. All those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Twenty-nine. Nineteen. Nineteen. Forty-seven. Forty-seven. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. And those opposed to ending debate? <laughs> Three. 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 One. One. Two. The motion, uh, vote being 129 in the affirmative, nine in the negative. The motion carries, so we have ended debate. We will now take up the proposed amendment, uh, decreasing the 1.5 to 1.25. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion does not carry. And now on to the main motion. All those in favor of the main motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion carries. Business under Article 17. Mr. Zeke. Oh. Ms. Alvarado? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll start with Ms. Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. Bear with us. We're almost done. Uh, you'll be hearing from three people regarding this article. Uh, excuse me, does, could you lower the oh. microphone just a bit? Yeah, thank you. Hazards of being shorter than the previous speakers. All right. Um, you'll be hearing from three people regarding this article. Uh, I'll be providing the background. My colleague, Andy Friedman from the Select Board, will be providing the bigger picture on how other towns are utilizing the audit information. And town meeting member, David Zeke, will go into more detail on the potential damages of gas leaks, as well, as well as what the testing would look like. This article was initiated by a resident who reached out to Andy and me asking if we would support an effort that other towns in the state are pursuing for independent gas leak audits. A petition was also circulated and collected over 300 resident signatures. This type of testing has a fairly nominal cost to the town and would provide us with a more complete picture of gas leaks in the community, including safety risks and environmental impacts. Gas catastrophes like we saw in Andover, North Andover, and Lawrence last year are thankfully exceedingly rare, um, but the damages can be extreme. Much more likely are the kind of unseen but very real damages that David Zeke will be going into. Uh, and some of those damages have potentially both financial and health implications for the entire community. I believe this is a thoughtful and forward-looking request with a low funding need and a high potential for the town to benefit from the information collected. Uh, Andy, David, and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Andy. Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, in uh, 
appreciation of uh, the late hour, I've slashed my uh, comments, so they should be quick and I'll read fast. Um, tonight, I'll, I wanted to briefly speak about the multi-town gas leak initiative. This initiative is a collection of more than 18 municipalities in Massachusetts that have um, been lobbying National Grid to improve National Grid's detection and repair of national ga natural gas leaks. Um, I recently attended two meetings of the multitask initiative. The second meeting included the president of National Grid Massachusetts, Marcy Reed, and as, long, as well as members of her staff. This development um, is important in that it elevates the discussion to one where municipal leaders are speaking with the upper level management, directly with the upper, upper level management of National Grid. If town meeting approves Article 17, we'll be able to apply the knowledge gained from the audit directly to these higher level conversations with National Grid. When one town speaks with National Grid, uh, I'm sorry, with one, when one town speaks to one of the largest investor-owned energy companies in the world, it can be a lopsided conversation. When over a dozen Massachusetts cities and towns, including the city of Boston, collectively speak with National Grid, that tilts the odds a bit more in our favor. I feel that a better understanding of gas leaks in Reading is important and encourage town meeting to approve funding for an independent gas leak audit for Reading. With that, I now pass the mic over to uh, town meeting member David Zeke. Mr. Zeke? Actually, I don't. You do. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Moder Mr. Moderator, and thank you, town meeting members. I'm going to give you a little background on, on gas leaks and some examples of what we're talking about on the, on the way to, to uh, proposing this, uh, this article. So there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers on this chart, and you can't read any of them, right? The, uh, so I'm going to tell you what, what, it, what it says. This, uh, this, this is a, a chart of gas leak counts reported by National Grid to the Department of Public Utilities at, for the last three years. And um, it's, it's broken out by, um, by the, the red, orange, and yellow are, are the grades of, of gas leaks. Gas leaks are graded. Uh, based on the, on how dangerous they are, so the the red the red color is our grade one gas leaks, and they and it, when they're found, they have to be fixed immediately. The orange color are grade two; they're considered potentially hazardous. They have to be fixed within uh, 12 months, and the yellow ones are the grade threes. Um, they aren't considered non-hazardous, and before March of this year, they weren't required to be fixed at all. Now, the, there's, the law, there, there's a new regulation as of March where uh, large volume gas leaks have to be fixed within two years. So this, this is the count. Now, th now there are a couple tre trends on this chart that, that I want you to notice, or I'll let you, let you know that it's there. Um, the first is um, total gas leak counts are increasing. To total gas leak counts are up for all three years shown. That means more new gas leaks were discovered than were repaired in those years. Um, and, and in particular, in, the, in 2018, the last year for with data, it was up 34 percent. The uh, second trend is that most um, new leaks are hazardous or potentially hazardous. So. Um, Two-thirds of the new leaks in 2018 were considered hazardous or potentially hazardous. Half of the new leaks were, were considered hazardous. So that means that we're getting new leaks on, on the order of, of 50 to, to 75 percent of the, of the leaks that we, uh, new leaks that, uh, of the total leaks that we have. And they're coming up each year as, as new, right? So what we had at 28, in the end of 2018 um, was not the count for the year. What was that? The, uh, so, um, <laughs> turn left. Okay. So, so anyway. <laughs> 
So we're getting new leaks, and, and this, and we're getting new leaks, we're getting new dangerous leaks. We are not making any progress. You may know that last year, National Grid locked out its um, union workers, and, and, and one of the effects of that was to get way behind on the repair of gas leaks. That includes the grade two gas leaks. So most of the grade two, the potentially hazardous gas leaks in Reading last year were not repaired. The, they did repair the, the, the most serious ones. Now, we, you, you can see this in the data. DPU noticed this because this is not unique to Reading. So, so National Grid is getting way behind in, in gas leak repairs, including some that, that, that are potentially hazardous. I might also point out that National Grid is replacing their, their uh, old gas lines. They are replacing 150 miles of leak-prone gas uh, pipes each year out of a total of 4,500 miles of, of leak prone gas. Okay, so why do we care? First off, <clears throat> um, methane, which is the main component in, in uh, natural gas, is a greenhouse gas on steroids, so, you know, which is 84 times as bad as, as carbon dioxide. Gas leaks are dangerous. Now, not only do we have the, um, you know, the grade one and the grade two leaks that have to be repaired, uh, you know, in, in, in either immediately or, or within the first year, but the, you know, the, the whole disaster that we saw in, um, in Lawrence was a mistake in replacing the gas, the gas mains. So it wasn't a leak. It was just, it was that the, when they went to replace the gas mains, they made a mistake, built, you know, pressure built up and, and, and caused 800 fires. So that can happen here. There's nothing about what happened in Lawrence that could not happen in Reading. We have exactly the same situation here. Gas leaks are also um, harmful to human health. There are over 100 chemicals, uh, carcinogenic, radioactive, and uh, toxic chemicals in natural gas. And that's because, in part, that we, we get frac gas out of, out of Pennsylvania. So there are chemicals that are inserted down the wells for fracking that come back out with the, with the gas. And there are you know, compounds in the rock, like radioactive compounds, that come back out with, with the gas. And so when, when you burn this in your kitchen, you know, that, that's going into the air. Um, and gas leaks cost us money. So, so the cost to um, repair the gas leaks, the, the cost to replace the pipes, and the cost of the gas that leaks out are all costs that the ratepayers bear. Gas leaks also kill uh, trees and other plants. Uh, I believe there's an there's a, a instructional motion tonight about, about trees in Reading, trying to, to improve our, our trees in Reading. The picture that you see here is a picture of a, a school in Boston where large trees that were in front of the school died as a consequence of, of natural gas leaks. And then and it, when the wind came by, it, it knocked them both down in front of the school. <laughs> Well, so residents in Reading have been noticing these trends, and, and one of the effects was, as Vanessa had, had commented, was to, to have a petition to fix Reading's large volume gas leaks. Um, this isn't the first time that, that Reading has made a statement about, about gas. In 2016, the select board actually passed resolution supporting two bills before the legislature addressing gas leaks. In 2018, our Board of Health joined more than 100 other Boards of Health in petitioning the, uh, Governor Baker to assess the health effects of natural gas before approving new gas structures, infrastructure, excuse me. But we aren't the first to do this. We're not the first town to take action. We're not the, um, you know, the first residents to, to be concerned about our aging uh, and leaking gas system. So I'm going to go through three examples of other towns with, 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 who have done similar kind of, kind of audits or, or other analyses to give you an idea of kind of the scope of things that we can do. And, and one of the things that, that, that's built into this article is that it's not prescriptive which path we take. And I'm going to explain as we go 
that what, where and how we would adjust our, our approach as, as, we, as we went through the process of, of an audit. I'm going to talk about Weston, Salem, and Wellesley. Weston, Weston kind of did the whole banana. So, so Weston did, uh, they did an initial um, methane survey, and then they actually measured all of the gas leaks in, their, in town. They measured the, uh, the gas leaks, they found uh, 292 gas leaks, 66% more than what National Grid had reported for um, Weston, and they, and they measured all the gas leaks. They also found 324 trees that were um, at risk from gas leaks. I want you to notice the, the picture here. This, keep this picture in mind. This, this is the first phase of measuring gas leaks, and it's an example of a street-level survey of methane. In this survey, measurement of methane concentrations are taken from a moving vehicle. Uh, it, it just takes methane measurements, stamps it with a time stamp and a GPS location stamp. The, and, and as you can see from this map, it is, it's just following a street, so it's just where the, where the vehicle is, is, is driving around town. Uh, and and the, the height of the peak here is a, is a consequence of two things. It's a consequence of the size of leaks contributing to methane and the distance that that street is from the leak itself. So you can, you can have very, you know, it doesn't tell you that, that exactly which of the worst cases because it's possible for a large leak to be off the road and, and nevertheless being measured. Now, so, so they, Weston went through this, through the whole process. Salem did a little different. They did the same kind of survey, but they were, they were more interested in their trees. So they were in a, in a process of planting a bunch of new trees and they, and they decided that what they wanted to pay for was a survey of all the 220 locations where they were going to plant new trees, which they did. They, and that survey found that 26 of the sites were uh, threatened by, um, by natural gas. So they postponed planting those trees until those, those leaks were fixed and saved them about $22,000. What you see in the picture here is that they took the data from that survey, that drive around survey, and rather than going out and looking and, and measuring each leak, uh, which, which Weston did, they just did a statistical analysis. They did some clumping of the data and, and, looked, and then looked at where the, the methane measured was in the 95th percentile or above and produced this, this picture here um, of 232 unique sites. So it is sort of like sort of like inferring a, a, a gas leak location based on where, it, where the methane is being measured. Wait of order. That is a good point. You've passed your 10 minutes by about a minute. Do you need extra time? And, and if um, you do, how much? I'd like to. I've got about three, three more slides if that's Three more slides. How long do you think that'll take? Um, well, I'll, I'll do it. In, I'll do it in uh, do it in three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any objection to giving them three more minutes? All right. Not appearing. Mr. Zeke. Okay. We'll just speed it up here. Wellesley did the same thing with the with the survey. Again, they didn't measure all the leaks, but they they uh, they did their own mapping. This is sort of a, a piece of a picture of Wellesley. That what I want to point out here is that the the red triangles are what National Grid reported leaks. And, and all the little dots, all the green dots and some orange dots and yellow dots are, are what the, the survey showed them. So they are using this, this data, DPW is using this, this data in their negotiations with, uh, with the National Grid for road repairs and so forth. So for us, the first step would be one of these road surveys. That's a relatively cheap item that's under $5,000. And then we can decide whether we want to use the, um, you know, the, what the next steps would be. Um, so possibilities are a complete audit or a partial audit, depending on how much we want to spend, similar to what Weston did, identification of leaks that um, have not been reported by National Grid or large uh, volume leaks or uh, assessments to our trees. Uh, we can do any, any mixture of that. And I suggest that we involve uh, stakeholders 
from Reading, from DPW, the fire department, the fire ward, or excuse me, tree warden, or other people that would be concerned to decide what the next best step to take is based on what that methane survey shows us. Notice that gas leaks, um, the audit doesn't authorize us to repair any leaks, and it doesn't absolve National Grid from doing its own leak surveys. So the, bene the benefits are, benefits are Reading owning its own community and understanding what its risks and, and, and situation is with respect to, to natural gas leaks. We have an old uh, gas system, including low pressure cast iron pipes, similar to older, old towns like Boston and, and Lowell and Lawrence. We don't own or control the gas distribution system, but we can use the information to uh, gather by this audit to understand the health of our system and its weak points and to use that information when dealing with national grid. So that's, that's it. Uh, Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the Finance Committee met on October 16th, um, discussed this article, and voted 8-1 to recommend it to town meeting. Thanks. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Uh, you mentioned something about $5,000. What will that get, the get us, and how long will it take us? That's <clears throat> that's, Zeke. that's that's the drive around survey <coughs> measures meth measures methane uh, levels along the streets of Reading. It it takes a couple of days. Okay, uh, I'd like to amend it to just a five thousand dollars, sir, Mr. Moderator. I'm not in favor of the whole article, but I'll give him five thousand to start, uh, and we can come back in six months if we feel that it's worthwhile. So, what is your exact uh, motion? I'm sorry. I want to amend it from thirty-five down to six, uh, five thousand. From thirty-five thousand to five thousand. Right. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the proposed amendment, Mr. Arena? John Arena, Precinct One. Mr. Zeke, if if the amendment as proposed by Mr. Brown passes, what does the five K survey result obtained? Does it get us that GPS coordinates and magnitude data you described earlier? Yeah, so it's, it's a series of data points with the, um, the location and the time okay. and, the, and the methane taken. And it's similar to what the, the 79,000 data points that Salem got. Is any of this dispositive with regard to National Grid? In other words, is National Grid obligated to act on a finding that, that sorry, that um, Reading finds? They're not obligated to, react, to do anything with that, that methane measurement, no. They would, they would have to respond. If we identified any leaks, we, we, they would have to respond to the leaks. But, 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 um, but Reading, we, Reading has no vehicle to compel them to respond. They'll do that's so. That's right. Okay. Is there a risk to, what's the recourse we have if we discover a safety issue? Which is good, but what do we do next? We report it to National Grid. Okay. Um, I'll hold my other questions if, for the subsequent. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the far corner. Thank you. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Actually, okay, Mr. Simmons, go ahead. But I actually called on the person up in the far corner. But Mr. Simmons, you're up there. Go ahead. And then I'll call on you next. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm going to speak to against the amendment. I think for $35,000, it's good money. It's the squeaky wheel that's going to get the grease. We have, there's no obligation on national grid, but lawsuits are always over their head. And they will act when they see the paper. The survey is good, we'll find out. Now, didn't you show that we had leaks already reported by national grid? Yes, we have over 120. How many? <clears throat> over 120. And we got thousands in the state, right? Oh, 16,000 in the state. 15,000. Six, 16,000. Think about it. So we got all these 365 towns around here, and you, you want to get your action. 
the way you get your action is you get their attention. So I think we go ahead and you get a report that shows what's happening and the seriousness of this thing, and they will act faster with us and the communities that have already invested $35,000. So I, I would say I, I would defeat, ask to defeat the amendment and go for the 35000 and go full bore. This is serious. On Pine Ridge Road, I watched the grass die on our street because of a leak. We have leaks and they're dangerous. We can't wait. It's not going to get better. These pipes get older. So I'm for the toll as it's stated and against the amendment. Okay, yes. My name is Jack Dever, Precinct 1. I got interested in the gas situation when we lost Heath for five days back a year and a half ago. And that was 87, I think it's 78 or 87 people involved. I've attended a lot of the meetings with National Grid, and I haven't seen anybody there other than a few engineers from town, myself and a couple of other <coughs> citizens. I, so then I contacted National Grid and said, what is your policy? They claim they walk the gas lines every three years. About how many technicians? I can't tell you that. And every year they send around the truck with the, with the cones on it. And also they do the business area every year. So they're taking steps to eliminate these leaks. We, we fortunately, in the Charles Street, Timonac, Tamarack area, have got a new gas line. It's not complete yet, but I feel safer this winter that I'll have natural gas. I'm dead set against $35,000. It's a waste of our money. We can go somewhere else. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the uh, edge. <laughs> Good evening. My name is David Panette. I'm from Precinct 1. And um, I just want to tell you I had an extensive discussion today with Director of Operations for National Grid Gas, a gentleman by the name of Dan Cameron, who said that he knows our uh, Chief Burns very well, who said he is very responsive to any gas leaks or any gas issues that come up in our town. As part of the contract for National Grid, they already do these assessments and uh, site surveys in our town. Why are we spending our town money to replicate something they're already bound to do by the contract for selling gas in our town? Yes, your data is somewhat skewed when you said there are more leaks. There's going to be more leaks that they didn't fix because their people were out of work last year for many months. So because they were out of work for many months, you're not going to have as many leaks fixed as you would normally. So that's data that's skewed. Yes, methane is something that's a dangerous gas in the whole envelope of what happens with global warming and things like that. But if you know anything from the, the world, world Health Organization, that's not, it, natural gas is not really where the majority of methane comes from in that the, the pro problems with uh, our, our atmosphere, it comes from cows <laughs> and the methane that comes from cows, okay? So I don't think we're going to do anything in Reading about cows, but it, it, it's mandated by the Department of Public Utilities that they fix the gas leaks. There are gas leaks that are grade one, grade two, grade two A, and grade three. And it's dependent upon where they're located, where they're located predicated on houses, businesses, streets, fields, etc., as to how they're prioritized and how they are repaired. National Grid, by the, peop the person I talk to that's in charge of that, seems to have that well in hand. If you do this study and you give this data to National Grid, they're not bound to do anything with the data you give them, nothing. They are bound, however, by leaks that are, that are found in the town by the Department of Public Utilities to fix those and to fix those 
in a time schedule dependent upon the type of leak that it is, a one, a two, a two A, or a three. So I am not in favor at all of spending any money, any reading money, to look for gas leaks that is really the responsibility for the company that already supplies our gas. Further discussion? Yes, in, in the back, yep. Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rebecca Bailey, Precinct 1. Uh, I just have a clarifying question, I guess. Um, you said that it was $5,000 for the street audit. Um, what is the 35,000, what was the reason to request 35,000 as the amount in the original um, motion? So, so if we do uh, actual leak <clears throat> measurements, actually, you know, measure the leaks that we have, that, that's $100 a leak. So uh, Reading has 120 reported leaks. Typically, there's about another two-thirds uh, uh, more leaks that National Grid is not reported to us, so I'm, so I'm guessing 200 leaks at $100. They, it also, it's uh, $100 for each tree that we would want to um, evaluate. If we want to assess a tree to see if it's in danger based on, on natural gas, that's $100. That's the kind of decision that we would make. How, much, how many leaks are we interested in? How many trees are we interested in? Do we want to set a, a, you know, a dollar limit? Do we want to partic look at particular locations you know, around our schools, around our public buildings, or are there particular places that are identified by the methane survey that where we would want to focus, but, I, but we make a decision about what, how to proceed and how, and how far we want to proceed. Thank you. I just want to say I very much support the original motion as written. Um, I think that this is too important to ignore. Thanks. Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. I oppose the amendment to reduce the fee from $35 to $5,000. If we spend $5,000, we'll learn how many leaks we're, we have, which is probably around 200 at a minimum. If we spend the additional money up to another $30,000, we will know the size of those leaks. We'll know how much volume of methane is being released. We'll know how far beyond the street that leak will going into your yard, into your basement. If we know the size of that leak and where it's going, then we can, in fact, force National Grid to do something because we can place it in that high-risk category. With just the $5,000 and knowing there's a dot on the map, they'll say, there's a dot on the map, and they're not forced to do anything. We need to first find out where they are and then decide which ones we want to measure. So I support the full 35,000. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sasso, and then we'll come to Mr. Weld after that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, so first of all, uh, in order to make an assessment of this, I, I, I do want to ask a couple questions as it relates to, so why why have the results shown, and I've looked at the data that was in the Western study in particular, that they've had the extra leaks and National Grid hasn't found them? Do you, I mean, is it because they're not using the right technology? Are they not performing something on a regular basis? Um, are the folks not trained? Are they not required to do this survey? Because my concern would be if we spend this money, we're going to be spending this money three years from now, five years from now. What, what, what is do we have any insight into why we're seeing, because I looked at all the information, I looked at all the reports, and it was noticeably absent. So why did we find, or are we going to find those results, as you suggest, versus what the, the company has reported up until now? Yeah, so there's a couple, of, a couple of answers here. Uh, first, uh, let me say, I'm not suggesting that we do this again. This is not, this is not for us to do over and over again. Um, so the first is, as somebody, as, as one of the speakers mentioned before, National Grid surveys one third of their, um, you know, their other pipelines each year. So that means that it's, you know, if, if a gas leak develops, they don't find it necessarily for three years, right? So that's, that's part of it, they're just accumulating. Another is that 
the, the kind of gas pipes we have, we have like 31 miles of cast iron pipe. Cast iron pipe is held together with uh, oakum jute with, with a pine, you know, tar in it. To, and and the, uh, every and there's a joint every 12 feet, and those joints leak. And that's part of the reasons you get gas leaks. When they repair a, a cast iron pipe, it uh, you know it just pushes the pressure a little farther down, and you get a you get a normally you get a leak in the neighbor in the adjacent to it pretty soon. So the, because of the nature of the pipe that's involved, this is considered a leak prone pipe. There is a constant set of new leaks that are that are that are appearing, and because they're only surveying it every three years, they don't find those. So is that survey requirement in the contract, or is it? Because one of the things I found is in the new law that was passed that did the grading, mm -hmm. it only required them to to do reporting when they do a survey in in advance of a project, not necessarily a townwide survey. They also do a, a just a regular one third survey, in addition to the when when they when the road is open. Okay. So again, my question is then you're suggesting that we do the survey, we're going to get this information, we're going to pass along the leak data, obviously back to National Grid, but we still have the potential of three years from now, six years from now, being back in the same situation. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is fodder for us. This is like getting a second opinion from your doctor. You know, this is, this is getting information for the town to understand where and if we have a problem system, or something that we want to address, so that when we talk to National Grid, we can, we can make appropriate plans, whether it's for road repairs that we're going to be doing anyway because of you know, utility work, that we will actually understand where, if there, is, if there are gas leaks in that neighborhood, better than what National Grid is telling us. The National Grid is, you know, it's not just that, that we've had more leaks in 2018. Uh, there were more leaks then, then fixed in 2016, there were more leaks than fixed in 2017. We're going backwards, we're, and and we and we don't really have uh, the you know we don't have the information to be as smart as as National Grid when we're talking about the the nature and the risks in Reading. Yeah, but to your point, you're you're suggesting that based on the infrastructure we have, we can plan all we want, but we're going to continue to see leaks develop over time and they're not going to pick them up based on the process that they obviously are not going to pick them up based on the process they have in place today. So, and we, right. we, we, and we don't force them from a legislative perspective to do this. Again, the, the yeah. updated laws that were presented back in, I think it was 2016, 28, no, 2018, only required them to do it in prep for a survey of a project, not, a, not an overhaul audit review of a town. Yes, uh, yes. So. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Weld? Thank you, Mr. Moderator Caldwell, Precinct 7. Uh, just a question. Is this something that we could uh, fund out of uh, the FinCom Reserve? Isn't that for emergency situations? Can't answer that. Mr. Lalashire. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, respectfully, the fact we're talking about it means it's not an emergency. Emergency is something we couldn't have anticipated in our wildest imagination. Okay, well in that case, if it's not an emergency, then why are we doing it? Further discussion? <laughs> Mr. Lippitt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Lippitt, Precinct 7. One of the things, first of all, um, National Grid has no incentive to fix these leaks because we as the ratepayers pay for the gas that's lost. We need to change that so they have an incentive. One of the things this data is going to do for us is let us go to the legislature, let us go to the DPU, say that National Grid is not detecting and not fixing these leaks and we need to change that so that the laws and the regulations need to be changed to make National Grid do a better job and fix these leaks in a more timely fashion for multiple reasons. I fully support spending this 35000 bucks. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Ventura. I, 
I sort of agree with the last uh, speaker, um, with the exception of, um, and I like the environmental side of it, and National Grid does need to be pushed, but what's the percentage of Reading residents that actually are served by natural gas? I don't, I don't know that. I don't, <clears throat> I don't have in data on how many customers. No, I, I, I don't have gas on my street, mm -hmm. and this survey will might give you a little ammunition in your back pocket, but we already know there's leaks everywhere. So I think the users need to push the state, the town, whatever, and push it from that side, um, not necessarily the whole town movement. Um, because like I said, I don't have gas. And when oil was 450 a gallon years ago, and you know, it cost me $1,200 to fill my tank, I didn't get any relief on that or anything. Um, it's a big problem in town, but it's got to be handled. A, the laws are in place. You've implied that National Grid is misrepresenting their findings, um, which is evident from the legwork that other towns already did. So why isn't there a class action or something being organized rather than just, hey, let's spend some money and for what we already know? It's 35000 that pays for the Josh Reed. You know, that's, that, that pays for other stuff. Mr. Are you done? How's that? Mr. That's, that's, all, that's not just my point. Yeah, Mr. Freeman? I, I don't know the percentage of residents that actually have gas in this town. So. Mr. Friedman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I think... Um, to the point about limiting it to five thousand dollars, that that will really hamstring us in our efforts to. The point is the whole point is to get data that we can then use to uh, pressure National Grid and pressure the legislator legislature to to address this this problem, which affects Reading and 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 many other towns, and hence the the whole point of the 18 plus town um, multi-town gas leak initiative. I, I think with respects to calling up National Grid and um, asking if they have a handle on the problem, um, I, 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 I would be careful on how I interpret their answer to that. Um, in fact, I think the, the fact that National Grid is probably fairly opposed, uh, I would gather, to this sort of a data gathering uh, event is, is because they know that uh, we will likely find more leaks. And if we, the, the key here is not just finding more leaks, but it's, it's, it's characteriz characterizing the extent of these leaks because um, by law, they will need to fix these large volume leaks within two years. And as Mr. Uh, Mon pointed out, it will also tell us um, who, who's, if, if the uh, homeowner allows access, it will give us information as to where the gas is going and what uh, plants are affected, what trees are affected, what homes are affected. So um, just limit it to the street survey um, really, I think, uh, will defeat the purpose of, of this, this um, article. Thank you. <coughs> Another discussion? Mr. Marina? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. Um, if I can summarize what I've heard so far, we don't trust National Grid entirely. We think they may be under-reporting under their leaks. We think that cast iron pipe is the predominant cause, but it's a systemic issue because it's, it goes to the number of joints, and I presume that if you don't replace the pipe, you don't have a fundamental way to solve the problem. You may patch it, but it's going to show up again a joint or two later. But the, the most compelling part of the story is what you just said, Andy. You already have the data. Just use the most, most powerful way to argue with an opponent is to take their own data and use it against them. If you already know they have leaks, the data is not in debate. They can't argue with the data. Just force their data down their throat 
and make them deal, deal with it. All you're going to get is a different set of data, and then the debate shifts to your data is not right, and you have no way to, to prove or disprove. All you can say is I measured it this way, they measured it that way, but they both show a net positive. So avoid the second measurement, take the first measurement, which they can't dispute, and make them go act. Why not do that? Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Hi, Heather Klisch, Precinct 7. Um, a few points. One is that I, I don't support this amendment. I do support the motion, largely because I find the information that keeps coming out about, for, for whatever reason, that there seems to be an underreporting of gas leaks coming from National Grid or from gas suppliers in general. And I think there is power in having an independent audit to have that discussion go further. I also support this in general. I think it's, a, it's an interesting frame to think of this as a user issue, a gas user issue, as opposed to a community issue, because I think of it from the impacts that are felt. Of course, there's methane as a highly potent contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and to climate change. Um, it's also, uh, I'm not sure this was covered, when, when methane is in the air, uh, it, it, when it oxidizes, it turns into ground level ozone which is a direct contributor to asthma and a trigger for other respiratory illnesses. So I think of it as we all breathe the air. Uh, so we all, it is, it is in the interest of us all to know how much gas or have a better idea of how much gas is in our community and then to proceed with, uh, with, with, with smart steps to get those more rapidly taken care of uh, beyond what laws and regulations are currently allowing. But we need to have that full information. And I like that analogy is a, like a second opinion uh, to, have, to have another data set to work with. So I oppose this amendment and do support the overall motion. Thank you. Yes, sir, on the edge. Mr. Moderator, Elaine Webb, uh, Precinct 1. I'd like to move the question. I assume you mean on both the proposed amendment and the main motion? Yes, please. Yes. All right. Is there a second? Second. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of ending debate, please rise. Twenty-six? Fifteen. Fifteen. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. And those opposed, please rise. Three. Three. Four. Four. Three. Three. Four. Four. The vote being 110 in the affirmative, 10 in the negative, we have moved the question and ended debate. We will now proceed to the proposed amendment, which reduces the amount from 35,000 to 5,000. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. Now we move to the main motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, hold on, point of order. Was there a point of order? But have we ended discussion on? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. She specifically said that. All right, I'm sorry, back to the main motion. All those in favor of the main motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion carries. That brings us up to Article 2, which is instructional motions, as is the longstanding practice. We have a motion to adjourn sine die, which means that we would not come back and we would not discuss the instructional motion. So you can vote on it, but I want you to have be clear that's what we would be doing. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All those in favor of adjourning sine die, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. So, 
Article 2, as the long-standing practice of instructional motions, in order to be considered, it must be in the hands of the moderator and read to the body by the start of the last session. This is done to give some semblance of warning to both those being instructed as well as to town meeting members on something that does not appear in the warrant. So we have, we had four at the beginning of tonight, so we will have four. The first one is Ms. Herrick, so Ms. Herrick moves that we take Article 2 from the table. Is there a second? Second, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Herrick. Ms. Herrick? I do have it. Give me two seconds. Oh, oh you have it? Mm -hmm. You calling for a quorum count? Did you want to call for a quorum count? Is that what you did? Okay, uh, we have a quorum uh, request for a quorum count. Uh, all those, uh, uh, please rise, and we'll uh, the counters will count our uh, members. <laughs> You're not here. You're not here. Sit down. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Twenty-six. Sixteen. Sixteen. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. We have 113. The quorum requirement is 97. Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, thanks for everybody's patience. I know it's been a very long and hugely productive session all three nights. Um, okay. Move that town meeting, request the select board to consider taking action to join the mass green communities in 220 or other equivalent program to achieve an ongoing energy, to achieve ongoing energy improvements, to create a plan to begin implementing significant renewable energy solutions, and to report updates at each annual and subsequent town meeting. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Herrick. So just to give you a little background on this program, it is, a, it is a grant program. It's been in existence for about eight years, going back to 2011. As you can see, um, at the end of last year, there were 240 communities that joined. Um, um, there are more communities joining. And um, interestingly enough, uh, this doesn't fund solar projects in a town. Um, but it funds like a lot of other different things, um, including new energy efficient gas boilers. So it's a significant source of revenue for the town. Um, One of the other interesting aspects is that um, member communities commit to an annual energy savings you, the town comes up with a baseline, and then for five years you have a commitment to the energy savings. Um, in our capital plan, we talked about a performance contracting that's coming up from renewal. It's actually fairly synergistic with this program because savings achieved through performance contracting can be applied to mass green communities. Um, let's see. And for a town the size of Reading, we could qualify for grants of up to 250k annually. Um, these are some of the examples. All of this is on the mapc.org website. All of these communities, you can see some of them beginning um, 
uh, grants for the last seven or eight years. So um, in a nutshell, we would have time to work on this this year. We would ha need to have an application in mid-October, I believe is the deadline. So they, the director of MAPC promises a fast turnaround on decisions, and we would literally have 30 days to put in a grant and potentially have money next January. And you know, along the way, we would probably identify areas where we could use some money in advance, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a mad scramble in December. OK. Let's see. I apologize. This is kind of small. So let's see. Very tiny. Again, MAPC.org, Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Um, they're also a technical resource for the town. They pick up the phone. Um, this, is, this has just been a very successful program. I put up Andover. Andover got 160 in 2010, 220 in 12, almost 200,000 in 15, 156 in 17, and 142 in 18. All different kinds of programs, retrofits of fire stations, um, LED lighting, um, conservation assessments, things like that. Um, let's see, Belmont, um, 151 in 2014 and $250,000 in 17. Boxford, 131 in 2018. Chelmsford is another one I pulled out. They've managed to submit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different, they're up over a million dollars in grant money. So, you know, this is a real program where we can get real money from this. It's, it's worth it. It, it follows up with, um, it follows up with the um, discussions we had on Tuesday earlier about our desire to bring more renewables into town, bring clean energy, um, be in a, from a FinCom member's perspective, you know, we're looking for ways to bring more money to do the projects we want to do, increase our energy efficiency, reduce our operational costs, make this override last as long as possible, and um, also following up with the select board's commitment. Um, and June of this year to, to bring more clean and renewable and, uh, programs into Reading. So that's it. Thank you. Further discussion? None of, oh, Mr. Brown. And then, uh. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, when I was a young fellow, my father always told me there's no such thing as a free lunch. So all these grants, I'm assuming, are going to come from the state. Well, who pays the state? Figure it out. Mr. Mosher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, to be as brief as possible in your capital plan, you'll see past similar examples where we have done things like this. Um, when we did performance contracting one, we were significantly involved in all of these kinds of activities with a program that existed at the time. Um, if Ms. Herrick had mentioned this during our FinCom discussion, I would have said we're already planning to do this. So whether or not town meeting supports the instructional motion as part of the next performance contracting, the town will be going in this direction. Further discussion? Yes, in the far, in the back. Yes. We have a motion to move the previous question. Is there a second? Second. Uh, because of two thirds vote, all those in favor, please rise. Nineteen. Sixteen. Sixteen. Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. And those opposed? Three. Three. One. One. Four. Four. Two. Vote being 89 in the affirmative, 10 in the negative. The question has been moved. Yes, that's 99. It adds up to. Um, all those in favor, please uh, raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Second, uh, previous, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. 
Move that town meeting and instruct the select board to adopt post haste a townwide tree policy that includes at least the following elements. A commitment to a, a commitment to strengthening our municipal forestry department to enable expanded tree plantings along roadways and in off roadway locations and expanded tree maintenance services. A ban actually I wanted to reword that but I'll leave it. A ban on the clear cutting of land proposed for development and a heritage tree program to protect large mature trees from unnecessary removal. Is there a second? Second, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. Two weeks ago, 11,000 plus scientists from 153 countries declared the planet clearly and unequivocally faces a climate emergency. Planting more trees is one of the most, planting and maintaining more trees is one of the most effective ways to help mitigate climate change. They store significant amounts of carbon dioxide. They also contribute substantially to our adaptation to a deteriorating climate by reducing daytime temperatures by up to 10%, reducing air pollution and absorbing water. According to US Forest Services report from 2018, 36 million trees were lost each year between 2009 and 2014 in American urban and rural communities there are many reasons for this, such as um, wind events, fires, disease, but one important cause is a swapping out of tree cover for impervious cover from buildings and roads, et cetera. Just briefly on each element, um, In terms of the first one, strengthening and expanding our forestry department, we currently cannot even keep our municipal tree inventory stable. Each year, we lose more than we can replace. This doesn't even address what is lost by disease damage and private removal of healthy trees. More trees along roadways will help reduce the impact of climbing summer temperatures. Expanding more planting to off-street locations will allow for planting of larger trees. The clear cutting, I guess I really wasn't meaning a ban, so that could be changed if we pass this, and the select board can change that. But I meant it more as a pause button. Um, if we take a look at uh, Lyle Estates off uh, Lowell Street, for example, and Veterans Way off North Main Street, it's a, um, you see how you just totally, you know, um, destroy any existing um, plant and animal life with no evaluation of what trees you might be able to work around. So I'd like uh, CPDC and ZBA to be instructed by the select board to take, uh, go a little bit slower, take a look and uh, see if some of the larger trees on these properties uh, can be saved. Briefly on the heritage tree program, um, some towns do have this. The state has a legacy tree program. Um, I would like to see us consider adopting this at some point to protect large mature trees. I wanna give you the example on West Street of the beautiful um, beech tree that's on the west side of West Street between Arcadia and Edgemont. Our tree warden estimates that that tree is uh, between 250 and 275 years old. It's being well cared for. Um, a heritage tree, tree program would uh, require the approval of the current owner of the tree. Um, we are all transient as the trees are, but we're here much more briefly and um, I think these trees should be um, protected. So thank you for uh, listening at this further, late hour. Further discussion? None appearing. We're ready for the vote. Oh, was there a discussion? I'm sorry. Ms. Snyder? Gina Snyder, Precinct 5. I want to say I really support this. And one added benefit that Mary Ellen might not have brought up is that the trees do help us um, control stormwater as well. So planting them in, with green infrastructure can also help us control stormwater in the town. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Landry. Excuse me, Ann Landry, Precinct 5. Um, I was wondering if you might consider some kind of friendly amendment since you said you didn't mean a ban, but this, as drafted, it says that we would have to ad adopt um, no, a policy that includes at least a ban, mm -hmm. among other things. So I, I, I was wondering um, 
you know, some, a, a policy on the clear cutting of land sure. or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Okay. What, what exactly is your proposed amendment? Um, Instead, instead of, a policy uh, on okay, I got it. Yeah. Yep. Is there a second? Are, we, are you accepting that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any objection to that being part of the main motion? Not appearing, then that's part of the main motion. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Panette, Precinct One. I just wanted to mention uh, the previous the speaker had mentioned uh, two developments: uh, the Veterans Way and that development that's off of Lowell Street um, and a significant amount of trees. We're cut on both of those developments. Uh, I'm a member of the Conservation Commission. Conservation Commission has a tree policy in town for replacement of trees and there is a plan for replacing of trees in both of those developments according to our tree policy. There's also uh, restrictions of trees, any trees that are cut in any wetland area in, in Redding, and anyone that lives in town knows we have a lot of wetlands in town. So any trees that are in a buffer zone in any wetland area in town are restricted from being cut and without the direct permission of the Conservation Commission. And depending upon whether you're a developer or a private individual, you either had to replace the trees on a one-to-one -one basis, or if you're a, a contract, the same, or what you can do is you can also um, uh, donate to the tree replacement fund uh, for the town and that money goes to the tree warden in the town to purchase trees which are then planted somewhere in the town of Reading. So we already have a tree policy that's in place in the town of Reading that has been in place now I think for three years and it's working fairly well. Ms. O'Neill. Could I just respond to that? Um, that's true. Uh, I do see this is going a little bit further because it's not apples and oranges. When trees are cut, uh, all the carbon dioxide that they have been storing is released. Uh, that's one of the reasons um, I would like to see us go a little further with this to encourage, encourage that. Uh, they take a long time to catch up the young trees. I appreciate that we do have that, but I think it's not enough. Mr. Brown? Point of order. Point of order. Well, the vote itself does not constitute the quorum because people may not vote. If you want to call for a quorum count, I will accept that. No, okay. Mr. Brown? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mutter. Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Um, great idea. You know, to the issue of uh, the clear cutting of trees on lots that are being developed, if we look at the lot on Grove Street, there was a historic house on that lot <clears throat> the developer bought the house, uh, came in, they cut down every single tree on that lot. So that affected immediately the neighbors on, you know, on three sides. Uh, and sure, maybe they're going to replace them with some young trees. Th that piece is okay, but, but the first piece of it that they were able to go in and cut down every single tree on that lot, it just totally changed the nature of of what the neighborhood was looking at. That's, that's real, we should not accept that in the town. We can do better than that. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Lippitt. We have another motion to adjourn sine day. Is there a second? Second? Okay. All those in favor of adjournment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Mr. Lippitt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Lippitt, Precinct 7. Sorry for the lightness of the hour. I will try and be very quick. Um, first of all, the use of renewable energy in town. Direct the select board to begin as soon as possible review of town and school energy use in order to identify opportunities to use renewable energy, including alternative energy vehicles, and to generate renewable energy. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Lippitt. Uh, just I think the town's behind the eight ball on this, particularly in terms of uh, vehicles, uh, use of solar. Uh, RMLD is doing some of this. The town manager mentioned we were discussing the um, capital plan about this performance contracting too could be accelerated and done sooner and could include some of these things. I just wanted to direct and make sure that that was going to happen. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? 
And the motion carries. And our last one, Mr. Lippitt. So um, this has to do with a split of the town's discretionary budget between the town and the schools. Direct the select board, the school committee, and the finance committee to review the percentage split of the town's discretionary budget between the town and the schools. And after initial individual reviews of this issue as a group, perhaps at a financial forum, engage town meeting members and town residents in a discussion of the appropriate split of the town's discretionary budget between the town and the schools. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Lippitt? Just very briefly, we've had this percentage in place. It seems to be sort of sacrosanct. I think it's time to take a look at it. We've talked about our elementary um, space issues. We have six portable classrooms that we've had for much too long, in my opinion, and we're getting three more. We don't have the capacity to serve um, the, the uh, early childhood and kindergarten needs. We're one of only 48 communities in the state that doesn't provide uh, full day paid, uh, free full day kindergarten. I think it's time to take a look at how we fund our schools. Thanks. Further discussion, Mr. Berman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Um, we have an elected select board, an elected school committee, and an appointed finance committee appointed by members of those bodies, plus you, Mr. Moderator. We have financial forums every year which are open to the public. I don't think this needs to be mandated from town meeting. I think that we elect our officials to do that. And this can come up every year in a financial forum. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's appropriate for us to mandate that when we have our elected officials to do that, and they have the forum to do that every year. So I'm going to uh, encourage people um, this is, um, to vote against this. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lasher, then, then I'll come to you next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to respond to the concept that somehow the split has been fixed for a long time. It changes every year. I won't bore you with the details, but there is a very vibrant mechanism to have a discussion between the two sides, and that split has changed, sometimes a very small amount, sometimes by a large amount, for almost every year for the last 15. Mr. Friedman. I just wanted to quickly point out that these instructional motions are um, not mandates. Further discussion, Mr. Arena? John Arena, Precinct 1. While I understand the spirit of what's been motioned here, um, a goodly portion of the citizenry, as Mr. Berman has indicated, is already involved and is someone who sat in many, many town meetings. The details can sometimes be mind-numbing. While I, I don't dispute that this is an issue of interest to the, to the um, electorate, it does require detailed study and a fair amount of attention, which and any individual can donate by simply attending the, the relevant FinCom or Board of Selectmen meeting. But it's not something that I would recommend be done uh, on a town meeting vote simply because of the amount of detail that one must absorb. It's not a cast dispersions on, on town meeting in the least. It is to say that sometimes there's a half a year's worth of work that's rolled up in, in a presentation, and it's sometimes very hard to tease out what's behind it in a, a matter of a few minutes. So while I understand the spirit of this, I don't think it's going to result in the intended outcome. And in fact, it may actually cause harm while trying to cause good. Further discussion? Mr. Graham. Two things, Mr. Moderator. First, the kind of financial situation we're in. We need to give as much flexibility to those who advise us as we can. And secondly, there is a body that can change the apportionment between schools every year. Town meeting. Further discussion? Then appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Ms. Alvarado, do you have a motion for us? We have a motion to adjourn sign and die. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned. Sign and die. <laughs>